So it's 7 and, uh, 10 on May 13th, 2020. Uh, this is the Conservation Commission meeting. Uh, I appreciate everyone. This is our second meeting post COVID-19. Um, as you can see, it's a unique situation relative to what we were doing before that. Uh, we've all, we've got everybody here on this Zoom meeting. This, we've, we've got a lot of people here in the meeting today. So, um, you know, I, I hope everybody can be patient with us a little as we're, we're all figuring this out as we go through, but I think we've got a pretty good process. Um, uh, we've also got a very full agenda. So um, we are gonna be looking to try to keep things moving and try to you know, let everybody present their project hear from the commissioners, hear from the public where we where we need to, and then uh, try to keep things moving on to each project. Uh, being past seven o'clock, we can get our, our first uh, do you want, public meeting. Mike, do you yeah. want me to cover the just the ground rules? And yeah, go so ahead, everyone Jeff. understand what's going on? Yeah, right, yeah every, sure, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm sure everyone understands that um, uh, the governor's order is sub suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to have this virtual zoom meeting um, mike went um, through the hellos and introductions but i'm going to go through uh, some of the ground ground rules uh, for an effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes uh, for any response please wait until the chair or the conservation administrator yields uh, the floor to you and state your name before speaking. After the commission makes their remarks and these have been addressed by the applicant, the chair or the conservation administrator will afford the public comment as follows. Um, the chair or the conservation administrator will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their name. Once the chair and the conservation administrator has a list, the public um, the chair will call on each member by name and afford them four minutes for their comments. Any applicant may be requested to respond to the chair or the conservation administrator. After public comments, the chair and conservation administrator will once again go down the list, um, a line of commissioners inviting each one of them by name if they have any further comments or questions or motions. Please hold on until your name is called. Finally, each vote is taken uh, during this meeting will be conducted as a roll call vote. If anyone who is speaking during tonight's meeting, please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you're not speaking. You can also turn off video on your device if you prefer. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Mike, I think you should at least do a roll call for who's here for the commission members. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. Uh, so well, let's just go through the, the roll call. In, in, in line with this, you know, as, as you guys hear this, this is just gonna be the order that, I, that we ask for voting. So uh, Mike Flynn, Chair, Conservation. Uh, conservation. Uh, Anika, are you there? Present. Martha? Mike, could you say their last name? Martha Moore. Yeah. Uh, Anika Scanlon. Uh, next, Martha Moore. I'm getting a nice wave. Martha, Martha. Moore is muted. I'm going to unmute Martha. Uh, Try it again. <laughs> All right. I am here. And are we recording this? Uh, yes, we are recording as of now. Okay. Martha Moore, member. Uh, John Sullivan. John Sullivan's right there. Let me get him uh, unmuted. There you go. John Sullivan is here. Thanks, John. Dave Pinnett. Dave Pinnett is here. Thank you, Dave. Tay Evans, associate member. Tay's here. I think Tay's unmuted. And it's showing you are. No? Okay. Okay, yeah, you're moved. And, and Scott. 
They've got, uh, I think that's everyone that's here. We're missing two voting members and one associate member. Um, but uh, I don't think they're, they're going to be here this evening. Yeah, I'm wondering if I'm All missing right. by some other name. Okay. Um. So uh, again, Chuck, thank you. you know, I, I think I said this at the last meeting that we had, but Chuck's done a, a lot of research for us and, and has helped help prepare these getting through. We've got a lot of projects stacked up um, and we wanna make sure we have these meetings so that we can keep these, this moving um, and, and hear what, the, what projects are ahead of us. But obviously that, that takes some work on, on the back end and, and Chuck's been doing a great job getting this together. Um, starting with the, the first project on our, our agenda is 30 Glenmore Circle. Uh, this is a RDA filed by Michelle Mark Windsor under the Ma uh, Massachusetts Wetland Protection <coughs> Act 131, uh, Section 40, and the Reading Wetland Protection Bylaw, Section 7.1, for the construction of a 17 by 30 foot addition um, with roof runoff and infiltration. And I lost my agenda. Um, I'll now turn it over to the uh, applicant to describe the project. I, I, mean, I uh, saw Michelle and Mark Windsor on there, Chuck. They are, yeah. Um, give me a second. I must have muted them. I know they are. Let me get back to where I'm at. I got it, Chuck. No, I guess I can't. Yeah. No, I can't. Yeah. Okay. It's they should be unmuted. Hi. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. So, um, yes, uh, thanks for having us. Um, we would like to um, expand our house. Um, family has grown, and we would like to put on a 30 by 17 addition off to the side of the structure that currently exists. Um, I guess if Chuck opens the plot plan. Is that not share on your screen? It's not sharing. We see like your um, your folder that it's in. Yeah, we, I, we see the window. Uh, exactly. It. Okay, let's uh, get back to this. There it is. Okay. Okay. So essentially right now we have a deck off to the side of our house, a covered portion and then an uncovered portion. Um, you'll see that it extends um, a little bit farther out into our driveway and then it goes slightly farther back than the existing deck. It's probably only about five feet past the existing deck towards the wetlands at this point and maybe two, three feet past where the stairs end. Um, we're about 82 feet and if you scroll down a tiny bit, 82 feet from uh, the barrier that we created back, um, I guess that was 2018, all the, um, yep, there they are. Um, it's a stone wall barrier that we created when we um, got your permission to kind of delineate our yard from the wetlands. Um, so for safety sake, we had everything measured from there, even though the wetlands start for the most part, um, probably about, you know, five, 10 feet beyond that, depending on where you are in the stone wall. And as part of your project, you, um, uh, the, I, I'm just gonna go through the list and then you can just correct me if I don't get this okay. correct. Uh, so you're going to remove the deck that's located right yep. here on the 50. <laughs> and you're going to remove the bulkhead, but build a new one in that same spot. Yeah. So um, right now that bulkhead, it was, it was a, a structure and we took it down and we just want to put a regular bulkhead door on there. Mm -hmm. So no additional uh, structure basically built there. Sure. There's going to be a new front entryway right here. Uh, I believe that would be outside of our jurisdiction. And the uh, side porch and part of that deck is going to be removed. And I'm not deck. sure if it's on, uh, 
yeah, the side porch and the entire deck is going to be removed. And is it on the driveway at some portion under here? And a 17 so, yeah, Yes. Point? So right now there's a, where the deck ends, the driveway begins to the left of it. Okay. Nope. A little bit before it's in front of the shed, the driveway is. Okay, right, yeah. Yeah, probably around there. There's a small piece, so probably the, the driveway goes almost the entire way to the property line. So we would be taking that small extra seven feet of our driveway. Mm -hmm. uh, the shed right next to this uh, cursor. It'll be relocated to the other located. side of the property. And erosion control is shown around the perimeter here. So. That's, that's essentially uh, the project. And um, I guess now if any commission member has any questions, Mike? <laughs> Mike, can you hear me? He's <laughs> muted right now, Chuck. <laughs> um, oh Let's see, we'll see, Mike is. I don't see that he's muted. Uh, anyways, do, uh, does any commission member have any questions um, about this project? Oh, there's Mike. Okay, yeah. Uh, so no approval. Uh, so I'll start. I mean, I, I guess I don't have any uh, questions. As just to, I think this was stated already, but the closest work to the wetland is 82 feet, roughly away. Correct. Correct. Um, I don't uh, have I any Anika other has a question. Yet. Anika, do you have a question? Hmm? Anika's muted as well, Chuck. Yeah, I'm searching oh, just a little bit here. So what happened for me, Chuck, just so you know, I muted myself in between that and I can't unmute myself. Um, so just for the commissioner's sake, try to keep that in mind. Yeah, if the commissioners can not mute okay. themselves, that would be best. Yeah. I do want to avoid some extra sound. So maybe we could work that out in the future. I cannot, I cannot verify that. I can't guarantee that there won't be additional sounds coming into this meeting that have nothing to do with this meeting. So <laughs> I'd appreciate, you know, the ability to mute or unmute at some point. Anyway, um, the only question I had was, um, um, do, do you anticipate taking down any um, larger woody vegetation, any shrubs, any trees to get this work done? Nope. There are no um, shrubs or vegetation anywhere near the deck or any part of that area. The only real shrubs we have are a few that go across the front of the house. I didn't think so based on my memory. I just wanted to ask mm. the question. No. Nope. All right, Mike, um, at this point, I'm, you need to ask if anyone from the audience has any questions. Martha there. has a question. Martha, I can see Martha, her. Martha. Martha. Let's get her up in there. I'm just curious about where the shed is going to be relocated to. Um, does that require any um, foundation pouring or grading no. or anything like that? It's, it's just a you know a freestanding shed. It has nothing below it now, um, and it's going to be moved as you see on the plot plan, just to the other side of the house, but still very close on on the side. But there's no there's no foundation to it. It's just kind of one of those old wood sheds that came with the house and has the lawnmower in it, <laughs> that type of thing. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do I see any other hands? I don't. Nope. Uh, at this point, I'll 
you need to ask if anyone from the audience has I'm, any I'm going to open it up to the public. Um, understanding that you guys are on mute, if you know, there's a, a measure to, to raise your hand on, on their participant view, um, if you're looking at the participants, there's a, a raise hand. If, if there's any questions or comments from the public, could you please raise your hand? At this point, Chuck, I'm not seeing any. I could also unmute um, everyone and find out if there's any, and then I could just mute everyone again. Do you want to try that, Meg? We'll, we could try it on this one. Go ahead. Let's see what happens. All right, everyone's unmuted. Are there any comments from the public? I, uh, this is Rick Devanna. I don't have a comment on this. Uh, you know, comment I have is that you locked one of my fellows out. Um, What's his name? Uh, Todd Dwyer. What do you mean locked him out? Is he in the waiting room or is he? Uh, I, he, he was in, but now he, he sent me a, a text saying he's been locked out. So I don't. Yeah, I didn't see uh, Todd in the waiting room. Uh, tell him to come try to come back in. I don't. Um, yeah, he he I'm wasn't not familiar there, I with saw him on there, but he, he's gone now. So but who do you which I'm, I'm, you with the I'm, I'm with uh, for the town of Reading. Uh, we're number five on the list but so it won't That's be for right. a while but i don't i just thank you i'll i'll have i'll tell him to try thank again you. okay try again what, what's going to happen rich is he's going to go into the waiting room he, yeah. he may wait there until until we notice and we'll we'll let him in from there um but, okay uh, maybe that's where he's at he doesn't okay yeah. thank right. you I don't see anyone in the waiting room okay so i'm going to mute everyone and then unmute the Unmute the uh, commission. Did I get you, Mike? Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I'm on my phone. So I can the next my... one while, I'm, while I unmute everyone. Yeah. Well, uh, do I hear a motion uh, on this? I have a question. This is Tay Evans, associate ahead, member. Tay. Um, my question is about the roof runoff infiltration. If that can be described a little bit more, and if if there's a figure that shows a cross section of the addition that we could look at. This is, we have the only plan we received. Okay. So there's so, no problem. Um, the roof line um, in the front of the structure remains the same as the existing porch. Um, it goes front to back and then on the back of the addition, it's gonna go side to side. Um, I'm not sure if that's helpful. And, and what about, I guess I'm curious about, um, there's a foundation associated with the addition and yep. what is the, um, the work that's going to be done for, um, runoff infiltration and grading around the addition, um, to shed the, the stormwater. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand, but we have gutters um, that will be on the new structure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what I, it's just like the existing structure with the gutters. <laughs> yeah, I think anything that would be caught on the roof for rainwater would just, you know, go down gutters and into the grass. Okay. Okay, because it says roof runoff infiltration, so I just didn't know if that was... Um, if there's more to that. No. Okay. Right. Sorry, any other questions from the commission? 
Hmm? If not, do I hear a, a motion? Uh, Chuck, do you have any other items? Uh, not for this one. Uh, we could have a motion to, uh, if, if one of the commission members would like to make a motion to close the hearing for 30 Glenmere Circle. So moved. Anika Scanlon. Sure. And could we have a second? Would one of the commissioners like to second that motion? I can second. I don't know if I'm allowed to, though. I guess I should ask. Um, uh, as a Tay, um, a member first, and if we don't have enough members to make a quorum, then you could okay. uh, chime in. David Connect seconds. Uh, I'm going to go through the list uh, for all those in favor uh, or for your vote. Uh, this is Mike Flynn for yes. Anika, uh, Anika. Scanlon. Anika Scanlon, yes. Martha Moore. Martha's muted again. There you go, Martha. Martha Moore, yes. Uh, John Sullivan. John Sullivan, yes. Dave Panette. David Panette, yes. All right. You're getting five yeses, Chuck. Sounds sounds good. So um, the meeting is closed. Uh, now, typically, if there was any discussions or any special conditions you might want on the uh, order when I write it. Um, uh, or actually the, the order is written, but that you would be adding to it. This is the time for that. And then if there are none, we would take another vote to issue the uh, request for determination of applicability. Uh, so I guess Chuck, the only thing I would just, do you see anything in here that you feel like you, there needs to be some sort of special condition um, outside of our normal language that we have? I mean, this project, Seems pretty straightforward to me. We've got the the everything in, in place. So, mm -hmm. um, well, Tay could ask about um, uh, the roof runoff in more detail, or have me go out there and make sure um, that whatever she's asking about could happen. That that could be a condition. But if that isn't um, uh, or something like that, but if there are none, we should just move on to issuing it. I think Kay muted herself and yeah, got her. Dropped. Try it. I did. Yeah. She may have had she may have had a reason to do it. Kay, you there? Oh, yeah, I'm still eating dinner. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, uh, I'm fine. I don't need a condition. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. So with that in mind, do I uh, uh, hear a motion for? Uh, uh, another motion. I, David Connett, make a motion to uh, issue the order condition for thirty Glenmere Circle. Just to be clear, it's an RDA, so this would be a negative determination, correct? Oh, okay. I, Anika Scanlon, want to make a motion for a negative determination for thirty Glenmere. Second. Uh, That's seconded. Uh, Mike. Michael Flynn, yes, in favor. Uh, Nika? Nika Scanlon, yes. Uh, Martha Moore? Martha Moore, yes. John Sullivan? John Sullivan, yes. And David Panett? Yes. All right. All right, thank you guys. Yep. Uh, thank you, Michelle. I will uh, send you, that. Guys. Send that out to you, but uh, typically um, you can start work. Um, um, there is an appeal period, but you're able to start at your own risk. And um, we can send that out uh, tomorrow or, or Monday and you'll get it soon. Okay. If you perfect. have any questions, just email me. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, guys. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Thank you. All right. So. All right. Thank you for the patience, everyone. Obviously, see, we're a little little learning on that one, but that's we're getting there. 
Uh, it being at least 7.15, uh, we can move on to our next item on the agenda. This is Zero Haverhill Street. This is a continued public hearing for a notice of intent filed by Mark Hall, MG Hall Contracting under the Matt Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, this is for proposed single family dwelling, deck driveway, retaining wall, rooftop infiltration, uh, uh, removal of trees and plantings and grading is um, all work within the 100 foot buffer zone at zero Haverhill map 29 lots 94 95 DEP file number 270728. Um, the here, just to give the hearing, go ahead, Jeff. I was going to ask, I see that Jack McQuilkins uh, here and uh, Jack is all, all your people uh, unmuted at this point. Or are you representing this project solely by yourself tonight? Yes, I'm uh, going solo tonight, Chuck. Okay. Um, okay, so we have you unmuted. And when I put on the screen, uh, well, I'm going to pull up the surveyed plan. And um, I think it would be important for members of the commission to not mute themselves because when that's up, I have to switch back and forth to see who's muted themselves. So it, it might be a little bit, it might be a little bit tough. So here we go. I'm going to share the screen and Jack, uh, with Mike's permission, you can take the floor. Yeah. So Jack, uh, I'd like to have you present, if you could just give us like a two minute recap. I know you were, this has been before, uh, you know, back in 2019 and it's, it's been continued a few times and I know the project has changed. Um, so if, as part of this, you could just give a, a quick rundown of, you know, what it was previously and, and what, what's now before the commission. Right. All right, go ahead. Okay, I'm not seeing the plan yet. Let me see. Um, I think this is it. Tell it is. Does everyone see that or not? No. Okay, let me do what I did the last time, which is just turn it back on. Okay, here we go. Turning the screen back on. We got it? That's yeah, there you go, Chuck. Okay. Okay, um, so I believe the last time this was before the commission um, was maybe back in January. Um, and it was basically a two lot uh, project. So basically there were two of those uh, single family dwellings, two driveways, two decks, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I actually wasn't at the last meeting. Uh, our wetland scientist, Norse Environmental was there. Uh, but I guess the feedback was that we had, we had asked for quite a number or, or some uh, variances. We had encroached a little bit on the 25 foot ZNV um, and also on the 35 foot no structure zone. So um, we, we went back we, we basically took out one of the lots and what you see before you now is just one of the uh, dwellings. It's 28 by 44. Um, we're no longer encroaching on the uh, ZNV. Um, we have a small encroachment on the 35 foot no structure on each of those back corners of the dwelling. Um, I think one side is about eight square feet and one side is about four square feet. And the reason being that um, we're really tight on the depth of the lot and we're trying to get just a little bit more foundation. Um, we're asking for a 28 by 44 foot foundation, which really is not overly large, I don't think in this day and age. Um, so that's the only variance that we're ask asking for. Uh, we also had on the, uh, the right hand side, we had a trail, a three foot trail uh, going back into uh, the wetland area um, where lot two is. And lot two is uh, the remainder of the parcel is about almost 13 acres that we would be donating over to the Conservation Commission. Um, we've eliminated that trail. Um, I guess there were objections, I think, from, from maybe some of the abutters. Uh, we did leave a 10-foot easement 
So uh, there will be access, but we're no longer proposing an, an actual walking trail. Um, and then I think the other big thing on this plan is we've added the, um, the tree survey. Um, we did a tree survey for all the trees uh, greater than six inches DBH. And um, I think we found about 34, 35 in all, and we're proposing to remove uh, about 18. And the, it, they're shown on that, the plan basically in those, um, those dark colored dots, basically around the house and the driveway. And we would be uh, proposing to, I guess, uh, either myself or Norse Environmental would, would walk with uh, Chuck and try to develop a, a planting plan to replace those trees. And any that we could not um, replace, we'd be willing to pay the, uh, I think it's $250 per tree. And I think that's pretty much the, um, the changes to the project. Yeah, so, I think that's uh, so we got this from, um, I hope that comes up. We got this from Norris this afternoon. And one of the things that's being highlighted here is uh, there are 18 trees that are taken down. And what they want to do is they don't, they would like to, to place them on site at some point when the building is ready. And they would do that with um, the conservation administrator it's much the same way we did it at uh, 364 Lowell Street. Uh, we went out there and we talked about the trees. We had a certain amount to, to place. And uh, right now there wasn't much thought put into this project about landscaping. So the 18 trees under our tree guidance would be about $4,500. And uh, in my experience, there's, um, there's places to plant trees on new property and they haven't taken that into account. So that 18, I, I don't know what it's gonna be at the end of this, but uh, they're saying that anything they can't plant tree for tree or two shrubs for tree, they will uh, make a donation. And they're saying uh, they're making a donation into the Conservation Commission for Environmental Res uh, Research or uh, Education Funds. And that can be changed if, if we like that's a new thing but can be changed so this is what i got this afternoon um, the other thing that i'd like to mention that i have the floor they're asking for a variance they're in the um they're over the uh 35 foot area with the two corners of the house and it's 13.1 square feet and then they have a, of course they have the deck and the patio and the stairs um and the retaining wall. That's all in a portion of the driveway, all in the uh, 35 foot area. So there's a variance request for that also. That's all I noted. And this is just for one house. So still a lot of variances for Yeah, so uh, I guess I can start. So the driveway, uh, Jack, uh, this microphone, uh, I'll, I guess I, I'll start with the questions. That, um, and maybe I'm figuring this out now that uh, I'm seeing the, the one house. But so there's the area to the left, and I'm seeing where you guys marked out the flags. There's nothing on the left side now that's going to be touched. For, for a while, there were, there's an old foundation or dugout area that ended up being marked as a wetland. You're not proposing any work in that area, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, what's, you know, there's a patio in the back. Uh, so you're, you're going to, I'm just trying to envision what, what looks, what the back looks like. You come out, there's going to be access out of the, the back directly to the patio or do you come out from the deck above and you walk down to the patio? Uh, is the rest of that area grassed? What, what's that look like back there? Um, well, it's, if uh, you can envision the, the it's basically a, um, a walkout uh, basement because the, the, the land slopes back from, um, 
from Main Street or Haverhill Street mm -hmm. down to the wetland. So the uh, the patio, there'll be a walkout from the basement onto the patio, but the deck will actually be up at the first floor. So the deck's above. And then there will be steps going down to the patio as well from the deck. And then is the rest of that area beyond, you know, ab above that boulder wall, is that going to be grassed? It is Yes. Yes, that little 10-foot uh, section between the, uh, the boulder wall and the um, dwelling would be grassed. Okay. All right. Um, I guess at this point, I, I'll open it up. Anika, do you have any questions? I do. Thank you. Um, I think I see near the corner of the driveway and the building, I think I see some additional stairs. That's correct. We, we have a, um, a small boulder wall along the edge of that driveway. Uh, I believe it's about a 12 inch, 12 to 18 inch. And um, the builder asked us to put in a set of stairs that, that you could walk down. I think it's, I believe it's two steps uh, to walk down to the backyard. Okay. Um, which kind of brings me to one, another question I have. The 25, uh, the existing 25 foot zone um, is, is the intent for that to remain um, naturally vegetated with shrub and tree and sort of keep it native? Yes, I mean, we're, we're not uh, anticipating going into that area at all. So um, we anticipate it's going to be as is right now. Okay. Um, a follow-up to that is um, including the two dots and maybe, no, including the two dots in inside the building indicating trees. Um, I counted 20, not 18. Um, we have, and, we did submit a list. I think that Chuck has that will correlate to the, um, the numbers on the plan. Those, those dots do have uh, numbers that are hard to see because I think they're in red. Um, I don't know what that's all about. Let me get to this. But uh, unless I miscounted somewhere, it should be You're talking a, about it. The tree survey list. Yes. There it is, right there. I'm right. Sorry, I'm having, hold on. My mouse is not letting me see that plan right well, now. Scroll down a little bit, Chuck. That work. I apologize, everybody. I'll see if I can find a new battery for this mouse. I, I have no control over my own screen here. I was toggling between a couple of views. Oh, no, I got it back. Sorry. Okay, so that's the tree. That's the total tree list because there was a tree inventory. But in terms, what I was talking about was the trees that were being taken. Right. So in that last column uh, under displaced, the ones that say yes should be oh. the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the 18 trees that are being removed. So I guess, so I guess I'm wondering why the plan, how come I can count 20 on the plan? Um, I don't know. I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm going to move back to the plan. Uh, I, I, I counted 20 on the plan as well. So maybe that's something to rectify for the next meeting. Um, Yes, if, the, if, if, if it is no, if it is 20, then, you know, we would be, um, we would be replacing 20 if we had to. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
another question I had is, is the foundation going to be um, excavated or is it going to be slab? Uh, excavated. And so that driveway, is that driveway going to go um, to the bottom, to the bottom of the lower level? Yes. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, I guess I guess something I'm kind of curious about is how those elevations are going to work out. Well, you're up at the street at elevation 197, and then you'll be going down to the. Uh, it's going to be a garage under. Uh, at at uh, let's see, this is elevation. Well, actually, the garage floor. The garage floor is at 197. So it's, so it's only really, uh, it's really, and then, and then to the left is an elevation 196. So it's actually relatively flat. Um, okay. For the driveway. Um, but it slopes down from the street. Right. It, it looks like there's a little lip, like the street is low. You go kind of over, am I seeing that right? Sort of like a sidewalk. Pump, yeah, and then and that's, down into the driveway. Yeah, and that's to match the um, the DPW's um, regulations for driveways. Okay. They require um, it to be pitched. Uh, I think pitch out to the street from the right of way line. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Um, are you anticipating any sort of drainage issues caused by the driveway? Uh, well, we accounted for. We do have a driveway apron around that bottom edge of the driveway. Crushed, crushed stone? Crushed stone, yeah. I think there's a detail on the plan. And um, I believe oh, it's- I see it. I see it, stone apron detail. Two right. feet by two feet. Right. That should help, okay. Right. And then we've infiltrated the roof. I didn't mention that out front, but we do have a, uh, a Caltech yeah. uh, chamber system out front to um, recharge the roof runoff. Yeah, Nick, Nick, do you mind if I step in for a Go second? Go ahead. Go ahead. I think I'm I think I'm done except for fencing. I was gonna ask about fencing, but I see it there. Jack, uh, so uh, understanding, you know, uh, just based on it, some of Nick Nika's questions there. Um, so you're feeling I, I can see in the front of the house and, and kind of coming around, you're feeling maybe up to four to six feet is that correct to get to the yes is there any what's what's the front look like is there any front door is there walk up to that front door um you know what's what is that i mean the, there, there will be a front door um i don't think he's actually has house plans yet i'm sure i mean i'm sure there will be a front door uh, most likely um a sidewalk Probably from the front door over to the to the driveway, um, but I don't anticipate much more than that. Okay. Um, my uh, only other thing that that as Anika was talking about the drip trench as well, you know, so the corner of the driveway. So it's it's 197 at the at the entrance. It's 197 at the garage. It does go down to 196 in that corner. Um, is there any thought to extending that drip trench at least up to the end of the the turnaround there? I don't know how uh, that's pitching in that area. Yeah, I was I was basically just trying to pitch it pitch it away from the garage, to keep water out of the garage. Um, but we could extend that that trench um, to the to the um, to the curve portion of the turnaround yep yeah we could we could do that Can I ask uh, a question now? This, yeah so that's what I would say at this point I'll open Martha go ahead um, I'm wondering about the deck and the patio being in no structure zone um, I understand corners of the house kind of half 
pick out there, but um, the you said to give access to basement, um, but can't you also get into the basement through the garage under access? So does it need to be um, having a deck and a patio built out into the no struct no build zone, no structure zone? Could the deck be on the side of the house rather than the back of the house? And my other question is, what kind of erosion control are you planning during construction? Um, well, the deck, I mean, you really can't go on the left side of the house, um, you know, over the driveway. Um, I guess it's possible you could go on the right side, but I think with the layout that he's that he's thinking about, um, with the kitchen on that side, and then you walk out to the deck, um, it just works better uh, for his layout to have it off the back. Uh, and then the patio um, would would walk out from the basement. Um, that's that's really I think the best place for that. I think I'm I'm not sure um, as far as the definition of structures. We're not anticipating to have any footings for those those items, so um, we felt that uh, they they might be allowed in the um, in the uh, no structure zone. Yeah. So traditionally, we've considered that uh, uh, part of well, the the deck's going to have like sauna tubes, correct? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have sauna tubes. Uh, if, if that was considered a footing, we could go with the, like the helical, uh, helical piles. Yeah. Um, uh, in general, we've considered patio walkway, uh, any sort of post going into the ground, part of the variance with inside that 35 to 25. Um, I guess my, my question for the, commission to think about is there there is mitigation being proposed um I, I would i would consider that part of the variance that's being requested but you know is the the mitigation that's proposed adequate for both the corners and the back so that leads Mark. to my next question of mitigation i understand that there proposing to donate lot two to the town for conservation land. Um, and I have a plan that shows a big area that's all these speckles and then a kind of, a, yeah, that plan. So is lot two that entire back part? Yes, it is. Oh, and so the one acre is just the part that's in white in the front. Yes. And, and I believe that uh, that lot two connects out to um, I think it's Timberneck Swamp, which I I, I believe is a um, is is a conservation area now. Yes, it connects to Timberneck Swamp. There's a there's a private parcel, a strip in between the two, but it does head out in that direction. Um, so 13 acres of property. That's all my questions. All right. I have a question, Tay Evans. I don't know how to raise ahead, my Tay. hand. Um, my Go two ahead. questions, um, following along with what was just said with the donation of the lot, has a wetland delineation been done on that lot? And is it is it all the wetland or is there upland and wetland on, on the donated lot as well? I believe the only delineation we've done is, is uh, you know, on the lower portion, obviously, where our house is. Um, I believe there is a almost a little wetland peninsula or island out there uh, somewhere, like kind of where it says Law 2. Um, but, you know, we have not done any delineation out, out in that area. I think it might be show. I think it may show up on the town uh, wetland maps. It does. There's a there's a uh, like a hill out there, um, and that's a dry area. But it's 
I would say it's almost surrounded by wetland in this area is probably wet, I don't know, 10 months out of the year, maybe, maybe eight, eight to 10. The other um, comment I had is a, um, a question about the patio, how that is designed. Um, and because it's in the no build area, um, if it goes forward, a recommendation that it would be made um, permeable. I guess I guess my thought was it would it would probably be, be pavers. Um, and I don't know if you would consider pavers to be permeable. There are some types of pavers that are permeable pavers, and there are some designs that where you can build it so that it um, has some infiltration. So maybe that would be a solution because it's in the no build zone to uh, make it fully permeable to stormwater. Yeah, uh, Tay, I would just, uh, I would concur with that. You know, generally what we've, uh, the, the commission, this, the perme uh, permeable pavers comes up quite a bit. And, you know, the question about lifespan and O&M and how do they stay permeable, we generally haven't allowed people to consider them as part of calculations of what is impervious, but they definitely provide some benefit. So considering how close this one is to the, the wetland that this is within the 25 to 35 foot zone. I, I think it's a good idea. I, I think I would support you in like, you know, it, it's going to provide some benefit to have those be permeable, whether or not they take that into account in a calculation of infiltration is just separate, but I think it's a good idea to have it, that it benefit. Mm -hmm. Mike. Um, Go ahead, Nico. Um, Two things I want to just point out is if you look between um, the back of the house and the back of the driveway and the wetland line, if you kind of squint, you can see a couple of um, trees that are fairly close to um, the stone wall um, right behind the stairs between the deck and the patio. There's a 19 inch tree there. Um, and near the bend in the 35, I'm sorry, in the 25 foot line near the driveway, there's a, is that a 32 inch tree? Um, so there's, I mean, there's, um, and actually now that I'm looking at it, there's a, the line that says area of foundation with no structure zone, that arrow line goes through another tree looking dot there are a couple of trees <clears throat> very close to the 25 foot line that are going to be close to that uh, limit of work. And I just want to bring that up that, um, you know, if the applicant anticipates those trees um, surviving, and even if they do survive, are they going to be um, in a, in a condition that, that the, developer anticipates the, the, the buyer is going to allow those, is going to accept the fact that those trees need to stay. You know, I think if we're talking about trees, we, we can get into, um, you know, we should look at trees that not just that have to go, but ones that reasonably you also expect to lose. And I don't want to encourage tree cutting. I just see that these things are very close to the line and knowing past projects um, and how they go and then follow up visits and all of a sudden these trees need to go where it can be addressed now. Correct. And, and in general, we have language within our order of conditions, correct, Chuck, that generally says, uh, I forget how it's worded now, but I know this is something back from the Jamie Mon days that, that we got in here about protecting 
something that was specifically not taken down as part of this project. Like you can't, they can't just all of a sudden come back and say, well, now I want to take down all, all six of these. Uh, proximity is not um, is not an, uh, a reason to take down the trees if they were left uh, when the house was built. Right. But, it, it, but that, that doesn't mean uh, the applicant or the homeowner can't come back in and, and go through the process and see if there's some other reason why they should be shouldn't be taken down. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to handle it. I just thought I'd bring it up. Uh, John, any, any questions? None from me. Okay. Dave? Um, me. Okay. Scott? No. All right. Chuck, do you have any, any, go ahead, Anika. Sorry, one follow-up question. Um, is there, was there a planting plan uh, submitted with this revised plan? There, there's no planting plan and they're going to, uh, they're going to, uh, re they've requested through their variance uh, request that the plants be um, located during the project with the help of the conservation administrator, uh, as we did at 364 Lowell Street. Uh, okay. Any plants that they can't find a home for are crowded, so, you know, they have 18, so they'll, they'll uh, donate to either the tree fund or they said they'd make a donation to the Conservation Commission. Um, Anika, while you're on, um, I just want to make sure, can you uh, just let everyone know how to raise your hand since you've been doing that the best? Yeah. Well, we um, I don't know what different ways everyone is joining this meeting. I think if I were on my phone, it'd be a lot harder than what I'm, the computer I'm on right now. But just in the bottom right, <coughs> underneath um, everybody's name, the big list, I see three buttons. It says invite, mute me, and raise hand. So that's one way I can do that. Great. And I, and I wanted you to go through that because I think that we're going to ask um, anybody that uh, is in a butter to this property if they have any questions now to raise their hands. I'm seeing one, Chuck, Peter. Yeah, let's, uh, let's unmute Peter and um, lower his hand. Okay. Sure. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so the question I have is that during the last meeting, there was talk of the access to the conservation land being looked at through the rear of lot number two. Uh, now that something that's going to be looked into is, was was that looked into? What are the options around that? I think we were just worried around just the traffic, foot traffic around Havel Street and uh, people walking in and around um, Vine Circle. Um, you know, Peter, uh, just... Just for the record, Rotary. could you also just, Peter, could you, uh, could you just state your full name and uh, address? Sorry. Sure, sorry. Uh, Pete, Mr. Cowie, 15, okay. Bonnie Circle. Okay. Great. So, uh, and I apologize, Peter, can you just, uh, this was in regards to the, the easement area and parking? Yeah, so I think during the last meeting, we talked about just the access um, to the conservation land. And we asked about, could this possibly be done in, into the rear of, of lot two? Um, so I think for us, we're worried just around the foot traffic, people walking around, coming from the rotary, you know, things of that nature, right? Issues that we've had in the past, right? So we want to make sure this is not inviting the people um, to come walk down, um, walk into the woods, things of that nature, right? Just with the homes, the children we have around, uh, something that we were concerned about and last meeting um, it was brought up that hey you know we understand these and we'll look into possibly looking into uh, the rear of lot two as access to the land. Uh, if I, uh, so that was looked at and I circled that spot on the screen I'll just erase it now hopefully uh, it's the uh, potential trail access off at A and B at uh, Crocus Street uh, were examined and the areas were too wet. There's not enough upland for trail system 
uh, in these locations. So it was looked into and it's part of the uh, documents for this order of conditions. I hope you saw that. Did everyone see that? Yeah. And this is from uh, uh, Norris Environmental. Okay. So under this plan, this, okay. there'll be access from Havel Street. So um, the access area is an easement. And for this, um, I guess for this revision of the plan, they've only given an easement. There is no longer a trail in this area. There's no longer, uh, I guess there was a stone dust path out to, uh, out to the edge of the wetland before. And if that was the case, likely there would be some uh, plans to shade any, any access. But right now it's just an easement. So it won't look any different than someone, the front of someone's yard, but that easement is there for the future. So yeah, Chuck, just um, from my, my take on this is so ultimately if that's being donated to us, we need some way to legally get back there and get to it. And so sure. this 10 foot right away, whether it's, you know, currently there's no proposal to take anything down, make any true access, but, but it, it allows the town and the commission uh, right to, to be able to get back there if necessary. Um, just Chuck, if you, if you could, I'm trying to think of a situation where if there was ever a proposal by the commission or the trails committee or to put something there, would there be notification to Barney, like the abutters again, would there be sometime in the future, whether one year from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, would there be notification that look, there's a proposal to put a trail, there's a proposal to do work, would there be any sort of notification? I don't, I don't know the. So that, uh, not that they're proposing this, but there's a trail, there's a trail wide, uh, a town wide trail um, general permit. And mm -hmm. in that general permit, if you are proposing a new trail, you have to go through um, the public notification process and come to a meeting. So you would be notified. There's no trail there now. And if one was to be created, the abutters within 350 feet of the property lines would be notified that a trail is going in. So Peter, I don't know if that helps at all is from the standpoint of you know, right now, the, the what's being proposed is we need a, a legal agreement that we can you know, actually step onto that, that land to get to the back area. But if there were ever something to be proposed in the past, this, this is not something that would, it would just happen. It's, it, would ha it would go through that town-wide trail um, uh, permit and, and go through the public process again. Okay. So, for, so for my education, um, so, you know, so it will look no different than it looks like today. There would be no three foot, four foot wide, you know, trail that's going 10 feet in, right? It will just look like it is today. It wouldn't be inviting someone walking by, or, you know, Correct. That's how it's proposed. Okay. All right. Um, it, you know, just to be perfectly clear, th there won't be any plants planted on the, tr the easement. It, it will be uh, left open, but grass could be, grass could grow there. Um, Mike, uh, do you want to ask if anyone wants to raise their hand? I'm not sure that. Yeah, are there any, are there any other comments from the, the public? Uh, seeing Rick Moreno, Chuck. Sure. Yeah. Rick, if you could, uh, just say your full name and, and address before you ask your question. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Rick Moreno. 114 Havel Street, um, the abutter exactly next to the proposed uh, property. Um, just, just a concern, just to put into the record, how did the rest of the abutters get notified for this? Because I do thank Chuck for sending me an email because I had emailed him in the past regarding this. But if I didn't get an email from him, I would have never known. 
about this meeting for tonight. And I just want to make sure. So I can answer that question. So uh, when uh, uh, an application comes to the Conservation Commission, uh, the, the abutters 350 feet from the property line uh, are notified, but after the first meeting, they're not re-notified. And we continued our meetings, keeping them open and active throughout the CV-19, having a meeting in April and now having this meeting. So no new notification needed to be sent out by the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any uh, other questions? You know, I, I don't see any, uh, dare we unmute? Sure, go ahead. That's a, it's so hard to get the commission back on. Uh, all right, so we're gonna unmute anybody who was having trouble uh, raising their hand. And if, uh, uh, just let us know if you wish to speak and uh, just let us know your name. I'm hearing none. All right. Yep. All participants are unmuted that want to be, even though some show that they are still muted. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think. Do you have any other? God. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the trees just beyond the, uh, you know, when, when the applicants or the developer leaves those trees right there, uh, just beyond their work area. They could die in the future from all the disturbance, but they, they are going to end up being uh, a hazard. And there might be something that we need to address in the future. These trees apparently are 10 feet away from the property. Um, I mean, I think that's something that we could get some more clarification on. And I like the idea, whichever commission member brought it up, to swing the above um, the deck that's above ground around in front of the uh, driveway area. I was wondering why, why that wouldn't why that wouldn't work also. And then the patio area that um, is on the ground, permeable, sounds great. I'm not sure if you have the elevation above um, you know seasonal high groundwater if that could work or not, but it should be investigated. So, I mean, those, those are the things that I heard that came up tonight that, um, you know, got me thinking about maybe changing this. Yeah, Chuck, what I'd also like to see, uh, what I said, is some sort of commitment on the front because, you know, a walkway, you know, I, I just, I see that as an unknown of what is, is the walkway going all the way around or how much, how much are we actually going to end up with and, and, you know, how much additional impervious surface do we end up up there? Mm -hmm. um, Chuck and, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I did in my, uh, in my infiltration calcs, I did include um, about 500 square feet for a walkway, just assuming there would be one. Okay. Uh, as far as Chuck, Chuck, as far as your comment of swinging the, the deck around to the over the driveway, I just I just think that just wouldn't work. I mean, you know, I don't know. You could have a conflict with the car going in and out of the garage, or I guess I guess if we had to swing it around, we'd probably swing it around to the other side. Right. Yeah, so I, I can see the conflict with the car. Um, you, know, you know, obviously it looks best and works best as it's laid out, but it's really close to the wetland area and it leaves no yard. So, um, Jack, was there any plans on uh, that hole that's over by where it says proposed 12-18? Uh, was there any 
plans on that uh, to, are you just leaving that alone? I guess that's the best way to say it. It's like yeah. an excavation area. Yeah, that's 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 that B series, the the one uh, B, two B, three B, four B, five B. Uh, that's that's basically where that hole is. Yeah. So that's all within the um, no disturb uh, or zone uh, ZNV zone. Okay. All right. Um, that's all I have, uh, Mike, um, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um. Chuck, as far as the vegetation, um, you know, I, I think we've done this before and, and it's been successful with you to be able to go out there and, and, you know, understand, you know, this is the, you know, I'd like to make sure we nail down the quantity and if, if a couple of those need to get in, they get in. But otherwise, I mean, I, I feel pretty comfortable with you being able to work out a landscaping plan with them in the future. I think we've had success with that in the past. Um, I just, yeah, I, I, I feel confident uh, I've, I've, I've worked. I, I assume I would uh, be placing these plans with Maureen Harold, uh, who's the well, consultant for Norris Environmental. And um, I don't think we'd have a problem uh, placing 18 or, you know, whatever amount of trees and shrubs around the property in the future. That could be written into the order of conditions. And it's, it's the least of my concerns. It's just the investigation into yeah. the above deck and the patio and in that area that that I'm struggling how to find out if that would work or not if we don't ask the applicant prior to closing. Oh, we have two hands up, Martha Moore and Anika Scanlon again. Go ahead, uh, Anika. Okay. Um, you know, um, in regards to the layout of the building, um, you know, I don't want to, well, this is just a thought. I don't want to design the house or design the layout, but I could see moving the patio to the right side of the house with an additional building build out to the right. You know yeah, what I'm saying? So sort of like a small, the right. sort of like a small L, because you know anybody who wants a house, especially on a busy street like that, they are going to want to have the security and the privacy of some sort of structure between their back patio and the busy street. I I understand that, but it's just a thought, and. That's what I'm gonna say. So I'm done. That that um, 35 foot um, ZNV it, it kind of bends around to, to the right, um, kind of where that 196 contour is. So to stay out of that, we're gonna to have to go quite a bit more around again to the right. And I don't think that's gonna work um, as far as a walkout because you, you're gonna be up higher on the grade on the right hand side. Oh, I follow you. Hmm. So you wanted to you wanted to have a walkout. It works best. In the basement. Yeah. With the with the um, topography of the land. Yeah, so I see I see even on the right side, and, and again, and you could say with you, I don't want to necessarily design this. I see on the right side that there's just, well, what Jack said is it's difficult to get out. The other thing, the only other thing that I personally, well, well I don't necessarily want the structure in that, that back, you know, within that 25 to 35 zone, if we could avoid it, uh, I think putting it to the right, we're still likely going to have a variance if we did. My other aspect, the other thing that I think about is, well, what goes in the back and after that is, well, now it's a, a 10 foot wide strip of grass um, or, you know, it, it does turn more into a yard. And I think there's more potential that you see yard creep in, in that scenario. I, I think this is a, a relatively well-defined area that I, I, while it's it's in the zone, I, I think would potentially limit creep, particularly if 
if we all of a sudden we added something to the right and then left that to be your know, use. Martha, uh, you had a, a question or a comment as well. Yeah, I was still thinking about the uh, the deck, similar to other people. Um, I'm picturing this house being built snug up against the wetland, which is going to be full of mosquitoes. Um, and I'm not sure a deck is really a good idea. Um, to be right there so you know does every house have to have a deck um but then you were suggesting mike that it would avoid yard creep by having the deck there instead so i i just i hate to see that much structure built in what is supposed to be the no structure zone um so i don't think the original houses that were on the 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 plot plan where there were two houses built, I don't think they were shown as having decks. I thought they were just rectangles. Yeah, uh, actually they were, uh, Martha. Uh, I actually have that plan in front of me and we had the same size decks, 10 by 16, same, almost exact same layouts. Okay. All right. All right, well, is it? I think there's, uh, I mean, my take, I, we, we've talked about this a, a decent amount. I think there's some item, open items here. Um, I, I do want to take uh, Rick's point into consideration as well. Um, you know, I, I know it, what I'm hearing is, I think there's a couple things, Jack, that we'd like you to look into a little bit more. I think it's, well, my take at least, is it, it, we're close. Um, but I, I think there's some items there. I also want to give the opportunity, understanding the, the situation with the public, that if somebody from Barney, or because we've had a lot of community uh, involvement with this project, still has the opportunity to, to comment after the fact, to, to send it to the commission, to send it, you know, you can access the documents through the town website. Um, you can email Chuck uh, through the, the website if you have comments that you weren't able to get in tonight. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm just gauging the commission here. I, it seems like there's a couple items that we still want to see if there's ways that can, they can be addressed. If there's, if that's the case, you know, I, I think I would open it up for a motion. Anika Scanlon, I make a motion to continue. Yeah. This is a story. Do I hear a second? Leave it for that seconds. All right, uh, Mike Flynn, uh, in favor. Anika. Anika Scanlon, in favor. Go ahead, Martha. If you know the order, if you guys know the order, go right ahead. Say your okay, full Martha name. Martha in favor. John Sullivan, in favor. Mia David Pinnett, in favor. All right. Uh, I think I'm even 5 0 in favor. Yeah. Um, all right, great. So this is going to be continued to uh, the meeting in um, June. And I think it's June 13th, but let's check it out. No, it's June 10th. And um, this will be continued to a June 10th meeting. We're in the process of asking. Uh, for permission to have a second meeting and that might be favorable and it will be posted in time on the conservation uh, division page in the town website which would be um, so the second meeting <coughs> put this up again would be the 27th of May so if we shoot for that it would be posted by the 21st of May and um, Anyone, any applicant or any uh, about or could check out the agenda online. I'll email the people I did before, just so there's no confusion. And if they could in turn send that to anyone they think is interested, it would be great. 
And I just want to make sure that uh, anyone listening knows that the plans and any new documents that come in uh, for this meeting and for future meetings can always be found on the town website on the conservation division page under current projects. Jack, I, I don't think there's a, a lot there. Assuming we do get something on May 27th, is you know, that give you enough time to get something in? Yeah, it would have to be in by the, the week before. Is that, is that correct? We would want, want that by, uh, probably next week you'd need it to us by Thursday. Next Thursday. Yeah, we, we should be able to do that. We'll, we'll keep you, you know, uh, you know, obviously you can continue to talk to Chuck. We'll keep you informed if we do get that meeting. Obviously, if this is a, uh, a working process. We're, we're seeing how much is stacked, stacked up here and we want to <coughs> you know, not all of a sudden have this big long gap if it's possible. But there's no guarantees that we have that meeting. Just we want to make sure you're prepared if we are. Okay. Otherwise, right. it's, it's Otherwise, on the town website. Yeah. yeah. It'll be posted on the town website. You can also sign in for uh, notifications for all the meetings, agendas to be sent to you via email. Uh, just go to the town clerk's website and sign up for uh, the meetings that uh, the meeting agendas you want to keep track of. And you wouldn't have to worry about when things are happening. All right. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you, Jack. All right, moving right along. I have next on the, the agenda uh, is 259 and 267 Main Street. This is a continued public hearing, notice of intent filed by Jay Finnegan, Stonegate Construction Corporation under the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act. Chapter 131, Section 40, uh, Reading, and the Reading Protection Bylaw, Section 7.1, for the proposed construction of the multi-unit apartment building portion, uh, building portions of which are proposed within the 100-foot buffer, border, uh, BVW, and the riverfront area. Uh, this is a continuation of that public hearing. Uh, I'll now turn it over to the applicant. Uh, Dave, are you going to be the lead presenter yes. or, or Mike, can you hear me okay? I can Let's hear sure you okay there. Online yes. that wants to be online. Yep. So I was gonna mention, um, first of all, David Cowell, uh, I'm a senior wetland scientist with Hancock Associates here on behalf of the applicant. Um, as, as Chuck, I believe is already doing so, we have several members of our project team with us this evening in attendance. Um, I am gonna give the primary uh, um, presentation but I would ask if Chuck is able to um, unlock the mute on our project team. Um, I believe they'll probably remain on mute, but I at least want them to have the opportunity to speak in um, and not delay the public comment period. So there should be, um, well, I see Rainy Gagnon is on board. Rainy is a civil engineer uh, with Hancock Associates on behalf of the applicant. Um, if Jay Finnegan is in attendance, uh, Jay is uh, the applicant, uh, the, the developer. Um, there should be Eric Cates. Uh, Eric Cates is uh, with Stonegate Development, the developer, the applicant. And there should be um, Josh Latham. Uh, Josh Latham serves <coughs> as uh, legal counsel to uh, the developer. Um, and again, I, I think they may stay on mute, but I at least want to see if we can. Yeah, so everyone's unmuted, and if they choose to be. Okay, great. And Joe Pesnola as Thank well. Joe is um, the senior project manager and civil engineer on behalf of Hancock Associates. Now, now, Joe is trying to be in two places at once. He has a, a hearing with Wilmington, so he may be in and out. But again, I, I want to give him an opportunity. To be David, uh, just uh, if I could, I'll, I'll add. Um, just so everyone is aware, the the in addition to, to you guys, uh, we have a uh, uh, the town had engaged a third party uh, peer review as part of this project, and I know you've been working with them. Um, yes. And Ann yep. Martin. Ann Martin is in attendance. Also yes. in the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, so Ann, I, I'd like to give her opportunity to, of course, to speak and, and join us as well. Uh, we've been very appreciative of her um, working with 
to start this process. So I'll turn this next screen. Great. So I'd like to, um, I'm actually very happy to present tonight. I think that a lot of the, the project changes since our last hearing have, have resulted in reductions in impact. So um, for the sake of brevity, I don't want to go into the, the entire history of this. I think uh, most of the members of this board are, are familiar with where we, where we got. So I did want to recap the last hearing though. At the last hearing, um, I believe that most of the Conservation Commission members were um, sort of, uh, I think, happy with the, the, the um, compensatory mitigation that we were offering and, and, and general support of the project as a whole. But as of the, the conclusion of the last hearing, there really were two um, really large remaining um, uh, issues at stake that, that we agreed that we would um, have Ann Martin uh, with LEC serve as peer review consultant to a limited peer review, limited exclusively to two questions. One was whether or not we are able to, at the time we had proposed uh, 2,700 square feet of wetland fill and had received feedback from DEP that if, if Reading was to permit that, that they would appeal. And, and we wanted assurances that we have a permittable project, that, that this will not be appealed by Mass. And then secondarily, we were um, still deliberating over the merits of doing in-stream uh, bank restoration and whether or not that would entail um, additional state or federal permit. And that was the second item that we had um, scoped in the limited peer review um, that LEC was to scope that. So I'd be happy to, to talk about these issues tonight. Um, so let's start with, First of all, I'd like to talk about um, our, our site changes and uh, I'd like to focus on the changes to our impact areas and, and uh, what, what all of that means. So while Chuck is pulling up our site plan, the, the, the very first thing that I wanna report is that uh, it happily is through, you know, surmountable feats of, of engineering and additional cost and effort we've been able to redact and reduce our um, direct wetland impact uh, significantly. Um, we've been able to reduce, uh, what we're proposing to do is convert the three-story building with 16 units of, of um, condominiums to a four-story building. In, in doing so, and, and this is not without challenges that we've, we've gotten to this point, and converting this to a four-story layout, we've been able to maintain the, the 60 units that are necessary to keep this an economically viable project. But in doing so, it results in a reduced footprint of our building such that we've reduced our direct wetland um, uh, impacts to uh, around 200 feet, down to 2,700 feet. Now, I understand that Anne, as a uh, uh, you know, peer review consultant has had some dialogue with Pam Merrill, who's the uh, environmental analyst with the Northeast Regional Mass DEP charged with reviewing this project. And she was generally of the opinion that we were able to reduce, now there's a concession in the Wetlands Protection Act that you can fill a fingerling no greater than 500 square feet. And that if we were able to reduce our impact and keep it under 500 square feet that in, in general DEP would um, um, would not appeal to this. Um, it, I mean, that's that's very general. But us bringing this down to 200 square feet is something that we're very um, happy to present to you guys tonight and, and let you guys know. So that that is the most I think the most significant thing at stake this evening. And um, you know, I'd, I'd like to ask the Conservation Commission if they're they're comfortable. One of the things, so the other thing I did want to discuss, um, um, let me skip backwards, is that since the prior hearing, we've had um, a, a lot of dialogue and communication with Chuck and with Ann. So they are, are generally familiar with where we are at today. So I was hoping that through this, this hearing tonight is that there would be some interaction with the voting members of the Conservation Commission in feedback in terms of whether or not um, we're, we're moving on to what would be a permittable project. So um, we'll, and we could deliberate this later, but, but we will look for some interaction. And I believe uh, even Anne herself is looking for some feedback from, from the commission.
transition members themselves um, in terms of, of, of so rather than um, I didn't want to belabor the conversation tonight with our civil elements of design changes. Um, the, the real major change here is, is our reduction of, of square footage impact. We've had to shift some things around a bit, but in doing so, um, I don't want to spend too much time in this. This hearing will not close tonight. This hearing will be continued until Ann's report is finalized. But in making progress, the issues that I'd like to stay on focus tonight is resolution to the two issues for which we um, went to peer review. Um, there's, you know, there's opportunity for us. We, we believe that all civil elements are uh, permittable, that it, it, you know, results in reduced uh, impact area and uh, other municipal entities in review of this are uh, in agreement that, that this is. So at this time, is there any questions on the reduction? Of okay, crickets, I'm gonna move on. Yeah, so um, I, I was uh, hoping to hear from Anne, and I was then I was and I was also hoping to hear from the applicant. And Great. I think, I'd like uh, to give my presentation and uh, afford Anne opportunity to um, comment on on our presentation um, prior to going to public uh, um, comment, of, of course. Um, Shock, are you able to bring up our impact? Sure. Uh, can you see the screen? Are we. I can, I can see it. Yeah. Chuck, right. what is what is Zoom um, bomb? So I would just I, go ahead with your presentation, and then. Um, yeah. So, um, Chuck, I, I, I didn't hear that. that I, I can step in. Uh, uh, I guess from my standpoint, uh, I know you and. Chuck and Ann have been doing a lot of work on this and, and I think it's been, it sounds like it's been going in the right direction and things have been moving. Uh, to, to be honest, it's, Chuck keeps us pretty well informed, but oh, it's also, there's, been, there's been so much, it's been difficult to follow. Uh, and, and I can see, you know, where the project is today, you've been able to move it out. Um, I, I guess it, it is, there's, it's, it's tough, at least in, in my position, I don't know how the other commission members feel of, you know, I, I'll be honest, I don't know what questions to ask, just from the standpoint of, I feel like it is almost like a brand new project in front of oh, us, or I don't, I don't know what, 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 what has been taken out, I don't know what's been put back in. Um, it, it's, you know, and that's, again, looking from, I know you, Ann, and, and Chuck have been kind of intimately involved in, yes. in where this needs to go, which is, I think, great. Um, from the, the feedback of the, the commission standpoint, uh, I, I'll, I'll let the other commission speak up if they've got something particular they want to focus on um, or would like you to focus on. But I think I, I think there is a lot of value to, for you to take us through this because it's been a while. I know there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, so. Okay. So, and I do, and I certainly agree with you, Mike, that it's, uh, there is a lot here. And I think that Anne has been, uh, her benefit in this is um, providing, um, you know, uh, expert level peer review consulting to summarize some of these things for you guys and help you make sense. That's the explicit intent of, of having Anne on board on behalf of the commission. So there's, there's a valuable asset. So I will, uh, I did want to pull up our impact area table. I know Chuck, I had sent you a copy of that. And I think that that's um, really illustrative of our, our plan changes in terms of looking at it from a quantitative analysis of where our impacts have reduced, where our uh, compensatory mitigation has increased in, um, in, in context of, of where we are today. Chuck, is that something you're able to project for me? Uh, I think, uh... Just ask me to, uh, where do you want me to go to? The impact table that I sent you earlier, the PDF. Uh, sure thing, PDF. go to the impact the summary. table. Right. I think that's good. And we can always defer back to the plan to actually look at um, um, you know, civil elements of, of site design and layout um, if you guys wish. But I think that um, the impact area assessment table uh, really, I think illustrates um, our ability to 
avoid, minimize, and mitigate for our wetland impacts. And uh, again, uh, moving forward and addressing uh, DEP's comments uh, and, and getting you guys comfortable. Are you seeing that? Uh, nope. All right, let's see what's going on here. Steve, while we're waiting for this, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. It's uh, it's David Panette asking the question. Have you? Nice. Is this uh, is this four story uh, got past the planning yet? I believe so. I believe I, I, it's either past or gone past. Joe Pesnol has joined the conversation. Okay. Um, Joe and Rick Rainey would be more suited to answer that. I can answer that. It hasn't gone through planning yet. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it, it, what happens if this doesn't pass planning? It's well, back to square Rainey, one. I believe, sorry, go ahead. Back to square one. Um, well, Rainey or Joe can answer that. I, I suspect that, well, again, tonight's hearing is not closing. And um, I think that we're, we're looking for forward progress here in, in some reassurances from the commission that we're, we have a permittable project. Um, while we work our way through um, um, planning. If, if planning has any issues that result in, in minor um, plan changes or you know, we're, we're able to come back to you guys um, with uh, you know, either minor project changes or prior to issues. Okay. So Dave, is that uh, impact table up? Yes, outstanding. Yep, okay. let's see if everybody can see this here. So this, um, this impact table, this uh, details what our previous plan was, and that's the column that says three-story layout. And this um, details the four-story layout, which is the plan that's uh, under deliberation tonight and what's under consideration. So first and foremost, it was the permanent wetland impact. This was direct wetland fill. And um, with the three-story layout, we had, um, it was 27, and I'd already spoken about it was 27,000 square feet, 2,700 square feet, I'm sorry, um, square feet of impact, which we've now reduced to 2007. And, uh, and we'll have opportunities to speak to this later on any conversations we've had with Pam Merrill regarding um, the DEP um, case on, on this being accepted. Secondarily, we have our, our temporary impacts, um, and a lot of those temporary impacts were associated with the, um, we had carried some temporary impacts around where the wetland replication area was. And um, Anne and her peer review had said that uh, she doesn't think that it's necessary to carry that. It, it was essentially the area where the wetland restoration area ends, where we'd be blending the, we need to match grades so that the hydrology, that, that it's hydrologically connected that our wetland replication area matches that. So that's just the collateral margin around the wetland. Um, so we've reduced our temporary impacts down from uh, 2,200 square feet down to 350 square feet, which is, again, a significant reduction. Um, our, our total wetland impact, and now the total wetland impact includes permanent and, te and temporary impacts combined. So combining the temporary and permanent impacts, we have previously carried 5,000 square feet of, of impacts, and we've reduced that now to 550 square feet. So again, significant reduction. The wetland replication area that we had proposed, and uh, if you guys recall, the wetland uh, replication was perpetuated by the town as a two to one minimum replication. That's uh, uh, two square feet to every one foot of impact for replication. And we had proposed a two to one wetland replication in uh, 5,500 square feet. Now, We've, uh, we have reduced our wetland replication area a bit by reducing, um, th there were two wetland replication areas. The primary one of concern is uh, there was a peninsula of fill that um, was paramount to the Conservation Commission to have removed. And we agree with that, that it was um, a, a very heavily degraded, it's a big bound of fill, there's significant um, of fill removal in that area. The second wetland replication we have proposed was closer to where the, uh, there's a, a dog kennel uh, facility. And that, uh, it didn't require uh, much grading at all. It was uh, basically gonna be blended, um, uh, just graded a little bit, tie in hydrologically. Now, the important thing to point out is that even though we are not doing wetland, wetland replication, 
reduced weapon replication area is that the area we had proposed for wetland replication is still going to be restored. So it it that is rolled now into the 35 foot no disturb zone um, restoration that we're doing. So it, it's just that we're not creating wetland by by grading it down hydrologically, but it is a buffer zone that they're still subject to the restoration plan. So even with that reduction now, we have a wetland replication area of 3,000 square feet. And what that represents is a 14 to one ratio mitigation for square footage of impacts. Uh, so we have 500 square feet of wetland impacts and 3,000 square feet of, of replication, which is far in exceedance of the, the town's two to one um, uh, criteria. We uh, now, there's a typo on here on my plan. I, I in haste, I typed a 25 foot no disturb zone. Uh, we recognize that's 35 foot no disturb zone. It's important to point out that the calculations we provided are 35 foot no disturb zone impacts and, and that it's not, uh, these were not impacts based on. So our no disturb impacts uh, in the 35 feet uh, previously was 6,000 square feet and we've narrowed that down now to uh, 4,800 square feet of impacts in the 35 foot um, no disturb zone. So it represents a reduction of impact in the 35 foot no disturb. And then our 35 foot, while the 35 foot no disturb impacts have reduced, we've increased 35 foot no disturb restoration. Um, wholesale, we agreed that we would um, um, restore the entire 35 foot no disturb zone. So the deduction of impacts is now rolled into area to be restored, which increases our no disturb zone restoration area from uh, you know, nearly five, uh, 1,500 square feet down up to 1,800 square feet. So this is really a summary that I think quantitatively illustrates um, our efforts to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. Um, this has resulted in reductions to wetland uh, resource area impacts, it's reduced impact in 35 foot no disturb zone, and it's increased our um, uh, restoration. Uh, David, just so I understand this 35 foot no disturb impacts, yeah. is that permanent, uh, permanent impacts that's essentially uh, permanent impacts within the 35 foot zone i believe 4, so yeah. yeah that's why we didn't we didn't break this into permanent and temporary impacts in the 35 foot no disturb but this is um it's it's still the the footprint of the building and parking and associated things so yes if you switch back the, if you switch back to the plan chuck and zoom in on the plan it shows the areas where work activity is occurring in the 35 foot, they're shaded. There's basically two, three areas, four areas, two big ones where it shows the work activity in the 35. So you can see, check if you can use your cursor as I talk from right working around to left, but you can see there's a shaded area that extends into the footprint of the building. Anne, can, yes. if I can interrupt just momentarily, um, I'm, I apologize. Chuck, Joe Pesnola is texting me that he's locked on mute and I'd like to ask if we're able to unmute Joe. Sorry, Ann. He should be unmuted. Thank you. Welcome, Joe. Joe and Ren Renee, I think you're off mute as well now. Uh, I see your hand was up as well. All right, so. So those shaded areas show where work is proposed, which is essentially building uh, the area around it, retaining wall. Uh, I think. The Joe can explain. I think some of it is lawn or snow storage areas adjacent to the parking, but those yeah. are the areas with yeah. that, that will not be returned to a natural setting or restored in the 35 foot where work is occurring. Yeah, the um, 
we 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 have decreased the 35 foot uh, no disturb. We had obviously more associated with the wetland impacts down um, where the wetland was larger. It was 2,500 square feet of wetland impact. And obviously if we're impacting wetlands, uh, putting the, the longer building in there, we're impacting more um, of the 35 foot. So, so the whole kind of south portion of the site that you're seeing not shaded in gray um, ha had more 35 foot impact there. Um, where the building is now shorter, uh, we, um, we have less parking in, inside the building, but we still have 24 units because we went, we went up a story. So we had to add some parking out back and that parking um, out back includes five spaces, uh, Chuck, uh, the five spaces um, kind of just across before you get to the, the turnaround, right there. Um, so those are, those are new spaces um, and those, the related grading uh, and the um, retaining wall there is, is making that, uh, that small expansion area of the, the 35 foot impact. So when we, when we talked uh, originally, when we envisioned this project originally, we had, um, we had, obviously we had 35 foot Im impacts, but we also recognized and, and that the commission recognized that there was a kind of a, a degraded wetland, a degraded buffer zone, a degraded riverfront. And we had proposed um, extensive mitigation in the, 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 the existing 35, and that's all the, the cross-hatched area uh, that kind of surrounds the whole development site. That's the, the 35 that, that we feel is degraded that we're going to um, upgrade. We're, we're gonna uh, tackle invasive species. We're, we're gonna uh, do some additional uh, supplemental planting in there uh, to kind of bring that, um, bring that back from a, uh, what was a kind of a mistreated uh, buffer zone. So that was the kind of the exchange uh, there. Um, the, the fact that we have decreased the, the wetland impact from 2,500 to 2007, uh, to 207, um, you know, we considered reducing the replication area, but we knew that that, replica, that peninsula, that, that the main re replication area that we originally had uh, proposed uh, as kind of replication area one was man-made. It was uh, material that was deposited there and that it was important to the commission to get that out and to remove that. So we've, we've maintained the commitment to, to do that, which brings us to the 14 to one replication area, which is, I don't know that the commission's ever seen a, a replication ratio that high. Uh, so um, that, that mitigation offsets the, the impact to the well. And then lastly, we have the, you know, the, the, the improvements to the riverfront and the stream bank in the back with, with the additional um, plantings and the stream channel bank, um, the, the undercut stream channel uh, bank repair. And we, we do wanna talk about that a little bit more. We had some, some correspondence with DEP to, uh, just today um, uh, on, that, on that issue. And we, we, we need to get our arms around, around that and what the, what the kind of the answers to the questions that, uh, that Pam Merrill from DEP had brought up on that. So I, I, we're not prepared to, to, to fully that piece of it, but I think what's important um, to the commission at, at this juncture is uh, the substantial decrease in the wetland impact from what was uh, a 2,500 square foot wetland impact, which uh, was not playing well with DEP, kind of got us to this point, got in on board. Uh, to um, to hopefully address that issue, and I think what Anne's going to tell you with, with regard to her conversations with uh, DEP was 
um, they just weren't comfortable with it. And they were most likely going to intervene uh, if the commission had even got to the point of, of uh, considering an approval on this project. And that she, she really wanted to try to get the project into a provision of the wetlands regulations which allows the commission um, to consider the discretionary impact of, of a finger-like projection of a wetland, uh, as long as that, that finger-like projection of a wetland was less than 500 square feet. So that's where you know, we, we focused uh, our changes to the plan to try to get into that realm which kind of gets us out of having to go through uh, the uh, um, the alternatives analysis and and uh, avoid reduce minima uh, uh, avoid minimize or uh, mitigate uh, discussions where where we were pro we were trying to pro put up put forth arguments um, with regards to why uh, this kind of takes us out of all of uh, out of that. Uh, and puts us into a place uh, that uh, DEP is much more comfortable. They're much less less likely, if not at all, likely to to intervene should the commission uh, see fit to to approve this. So I I think in the end, yes, it's it's uh, it you could see it as a new project, um, but by and large, it's about shortening the building. It's about getting into that finger-like projection wetland impact, and it's about um, you know trying to to present a project that can be approved and not uh, not have DEP intervene because that's not it's not good for us. It's not good for for your commission. It's not good for the town. Uh, just going back to the question on CPDC, um, we had hoped to be at CPDC on Monday, uh, but they pushed us until June. I think they're grappling with the COVID crisis and, and how to continue um, uh, hearings and so forth. Uh, and uh, in, in, re in retrospect, I think that's, that's kind of a blessing because um, the changes that are being driven here are Conservation Commission related. They're trying to address on point the, the DEP comments. By and large, we were in a very good place with CPDC and they were just waiting for your commission to, to act. Um, and we were, um, we were trying to get there. So we kind of cut, cut to a fork in the road and had to go down the other way uh, to, to address on point the DEP comments. Um, that Anne has uh, was was brought in to to help with that, and and I think the communic the line of communication between Anne and and Pam Merrill at DEP was invaluable to be able to to really um, get us to this point that that we think um, not only hopefully the the commission will be able to embrace the changes, but uh, again uh, DEP will not. Uh, will not inter intervene. All right. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Anne, I'd like to get you, your take on this, but before I do, I, I know, Anika, you've uh, raised your hand. I, I guess I'd, I'd uh, go if you've got some, if you've got a question about this prior to Anne. Thanks, Mike. I've got a couple little things, but I think I'd like to hear Anne's, uh, Anne first. Yeah. So, and you know, welcome. This is the first time you're before the commission. I know it's been, uh, again, a unique process, uh, but I, I know you've been doing a lot here. You know, I've heard this from the applicant. I've heard it from Chuck. So, um, I, you know, I guess from my take, I'd like to give you the floor more from, you know, I don't know if you've got anything specific to say, but just kind of what you see, what your approach is, and hopefully, you know, uh, from our standpoint, if the commission has questions specifically for you in regards to some of this some of these items we can kind of get there. Okay, sure. Um, so once I was brought on board, what I did was I called Pam and told her that I had been brought on board to help the commission to ensure that all of the departments 
concerns were addressed and there was an intervention. I was very straightforward with her. I've known Pam for a long time. So we spoke for quite a while and she rolled out the plans at her house. I rolled out the plans at my house and we went through all of their comments. And I asked her a lot of clarifying questions just to make sure I understood exactly what her thought process was. One of their primary concerns was that the project was not permittable, but she did not go into a tremendous amount of detail articulating exactly where in the regs, what she was referencing, and I wanted to make sure I pinned that down. Um, then we held a site visit and walked the site. We made some changes to the uh, wetland boundary, um, maybe a bit surprising, but we moved the wetland line down a little bit. David was, was pretty conservative, and there were places where on the original plan, it appeared as if wetlands were going to be altered in order to do the wetland replication. So we <coughs> changes to the wetland boundary for the wetland boundary now sits at the toe of that slope of fill material. So that was a change that was on the plan. The most significant issue is what has been articulated by Joe and David is that Pam made it very clear to me that um, the alternatives analysis that was done while it addressed cost, which is allowed under the riverfront area, at addressing costs as an impact is not allowed in evaluating the BBW impacts. And so I pushed Joe and them, um, and I had sent an email, I'm sure that you guys have seen it or will have a chance to read it, just asking them to look at a number of different scenarios to reduce the impacts, which have got them to where they are now. Joe's referred to this finger-like projection uh, impact statute. I discussed that with Pam after the revised. It kind of, there was a there was an interim draft plan that was even before this one that he sent around. I spoke with Pam and I told her that I did not want to advise the commission or encourage this applicant to proceed forward in a manner that the department would intervene because I felt like that would waste everybody's time and everyone's money. And that wasn't what any of the parties involved were interested in. Um, she didn't have a lot in front of her at the time. So she said, I can't go on record in an email saying that she was happy. She said, if you say, she said, I had been to the site. So she indicated that if I thought it was a finger like projection and met the statute that she would trust that. Um, I included some photos in some of the materials that I uh, commented on that also went to DEP because I wanted her to get a feel for what the field conditions were like. I do believe the department will accept that this is a finger-like projection impact. Um, there, in the most recent set of materials that were sent around, she only commented on the bank restoration work. And this is live as in, I don't know if it came in today or yesterday, but um, Chuck and Joe and Pam and I have all kind of been commenting or commenting on each other's comments about that bank restoration. And her concerns basically were that she wanted more information on the plans to clarify how it was gonna, how it was gonna occur. I can let, I'll let Joe speak for himself as far as his concerns related to the bank um, mitigation work. A couple of days ago, the plan set that's before you, I sent around some comments. I would consider them kind of cleanup comments. They're, they're comments on notes, they're comments on just various things that are linked to other items that, that um, I think will reassure the department that all the bases are covered. And one of the things that Pam expressed a concern to me was, who's going to do this mitigation and how will it be supervised? So I made some suggestions to notes and things like that, but I think they have substantially revised the plan and are 90% of the way there to getting to a plan that I feel like I could recommend that the commission approve and that the department would not have a problem with short of resolving the stream bank restoration concerns that remain open. 
and I can answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Anne. I guess I'll jump in for a sec. I thought, Mike, maybe you would jump in, but there was a pause. I don't want to waste time. Um, I'm, um, I'm pretty astounded at the new plans. I'm, I'm, I think it's an improvement um, in a lot of ways. One area that I, I'm just noticing um, that's receiving almost, almost no attention uh, and I'm not saying it has to, but I just want to bring it up. One area that's bringing that's <laughs> that has no attention is the south um, side of the site between the building um, and the abutter, uh, kind of along Main Street. Um, and with the exception that there is a wetland uh, restoration area there adjacent to the wall. Um, and I guess one of, one of, I know this is a detailed question. I know there's still a lot that needs to be reviewed. I guess one of the questions I have is, um, some of my concerns with that area are, um, wind blown litter and debris from the street. Um, and I'm not sure the habitat quality in that area. So I'm wondering if the wetland restoration in that area um, is, just, is just going to be um, piecemeal if it's only overtaken in the subsequent years by inv other invasive plants that are dominant in that area. So that that's why I had my hand raised. So you're talking about in the southwest corner, right up there on the street, where the there is no 35 foot buffer restoration proposed. Right. I guess um, I think my understanding of the quality of vegetation in that area is that it's pretty pretty degraded. It's full of a lot of invasives, and so I I'm just asking the question. Um, is, is the proposed wetland restoration that's gonna happen over there, is that gonna be, is that gonna survive if the rest of that, if the rest of the vegetation over there is going to overwhelm it? So the only restoration that's occurring over there is there at the base of the wall? Right, around that's what I'm talking about. It's like, 161 square feet that little right sliver. right um <laughs> it's hard for me to tell you exactly how it's going to fare i can say that they have proposed appropriate plantings for the area uh how well it will fend off intrusion by other invasive species um, I mean, I think they are making a concerted effort on this site to manage um, the 35 foot buffer. David might be able to speak more to the species. I, I, I think I can, I can articulate a response. Yeah. Um, uh, but before I respond, uh, Chuck, uh, just one more time, uh, I regret. Um, Joe, uh, Joe again is on mute and he's locked out. Uh, I, I'd request that you could possibly unlock Joe Pesnola once once again. But while while you're unlocking unlocking Joe, I think I can respond to the question at hand. So Dave, um, real quick, I yes. think the reason why he's getting locked out is I did this at the beginning too. Yeah. If you put yourself on mute, yes, you cannot <clears throat> take yourself off. So he Joe's got to just in. yeah, he's got to no, hang I'll, with us. That's it. He may have needed to sneeze or something. Um, the the in, one in, the one thing I would say to Dave, sorry, I'll, I'll just add to that. I don't know. Everybody has a different setup here. Um, if you are set up with, you know, uh, if you're set up by list, you know, speaking through your phone but working on the computer, you can mute your phone, not necessarily mute the the Zoom meeting, and you'll oh, be able to go in and out. So 
if somebody is concerned about muting and staying quiet and they are on their phone, and there's an a alternative option there that, that can work so we don't have the staff report. Great. Great. Yeah. And so I, I'd like to respond to the question, and, and, and um, I think Ann may agree to with me. Um, most often in, in the written order of conditions, there's uh, a two or three year period of monitoring that coincides with wetland restoration and, and um, uh, restoration plantings and invasive species treatments. Um, I fully expect that the Conservation Commission would um, have a condition that requiring um, annual monitoring where a qualified ecologist would actually go out, they would take inventory of the, the native um, nursery stock plantings that went in um, to, to check and make sure that they remain viable um, and, and are on track to, to uh, exist into the future and also take note of any encroachment by invasive species. And, and this affords opportunity and adaptive management that based on these reports, we are observing um, invasive species encroachment coming back in these areas that we have opportunity to treat them again and, and sort of uh, nurse the, the restoration area through that two or three year period prior to request for a full issuance of certificate of compliance. Um, that, that's my response. I think I think Nika raises an interesting point, though, because I feel like what she's pointing out yep. is that we are making efforts to restore the 35 foot buffer and to replant and do invasive species management and replant it everywhere except for at the front of the site. Okay. So and I'm thrilled, and I'm thrilled with the restoration of the of that buffer. Yep, Joe. I, I just point out that it's not there. It's an easy, and, it was an Joe, easy, go ahead. Easy fix. Easy fix. Yeah. I think we vacated that area, um, and we're concentrating on reducing the the wetland impact, uh, and failed to see that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I, I I would be happy to get into that 35 foot um fringe uh, along that wetland in the south area as well as um you know the the area between main street and that 35 uh, to do invasive species management to do um to do this a similar type of buffer zone restoration i think it it, it benefits um our client from the standpoint of of uh making it better and not blight it and take the trash out of there and and, and whatnot um and uh and it benefits the the, the weapon the commission the the commission's in, uh, intentions to to do that so envision more cross hatching that runs across uh across that southern area and we'll, we'll work with Anne to you know to identify any unique uh, situations that are out there and, and put dave on the uh, hunt for invasive species and, and uh, so supplement what we were proposing to do. Uh, thank you for the point, and sorry for, for missing it, but we were we were uh, focused on some other stuff. Uh, anyway, so we will make that make that commitment. Is there a landscape plan for this? Because I'm when you were there, talking, there is. There's a, there's a landscape plan. We we did not resubmit the landscape plan. Um, because we were focused again on the mitigation and the restoration plan. We, are, we have now prepared that um, to get it to CPDC. Uh, it's it, the landscape plan I will tell you is, is highly focused on the built environment, the, the development site itself. It's not something that gets into how we're revegetating any of the buffers or uh, any, of, any of that. Um, that that the landscaping for or the planting for the the buffer mitigation of the restoration is on this plan and the landscape plan is is uh, kind of above the wall and around the building and around the parking lot. So, okay I, we, just, I just didn't know if there was additional landscaping along the street that the applicant might obviously want to do that was beyond the 35 you should well, make sure that you get a plan to the commission that gets approved in the set and that we all look at to yeah. make sure that that's included. Right, right now we're not, but but certainly, I think if it 
if it benefits this um, fixing up of the south portion and not just leaving that whole south portion in its current degraded state, um, then we kind of have maybe some street trees up there that then go into the buffer uh, restoration plantings, invasive species management and so forth. So it's all integrated. We'll, we'll do that as well. Okay. All right. Um, and so before, you know, I, I think at this point, I will, before we move to this back area, the bank restoration, I guess, Anne, I, I've got two quick questions for you. And, um, so you, you said you felt like, and, and I guess I, I'd like to leave the restoration piece out of it. We're, we're about 90% there, uh, the way you see it. You know, I know you gave some good comments on the, the last plan set. Are there items up in this front besides what we've heard today that, uh, you know, is the 10% that you're know, dealing with the issues in the back at this point and, and just dealing with those editorial comments or are the, so what, what do you see as the, the major challenges that are still out there in this front portion? Forgetting about the riverfront right now. Um, I had asked, showing them to uh, clarify the construction of the retaining wall yeah. um, and to include a detail just partially um, fortunately or unfortunately I have spent more time than I ever wanted to overseeing the construction of Bursa Lock and retaining walls near wetlands and seeing all kinds of peril and so one of the questions one of the things that he and i had dialogue about was to ensure that there was sufficient space between the wall and the building for that geo fiber fabric that comes back that is constructed in lifts with those walls because i had a project where the engineer and it wasn't joe did not provide adequate space and we went to construction, it became a problem. And so sometimes those kinds of things pop up. And, I, and so working through details like that, it's not something that would change uh, the building layout or the grading. It's more like, you know, I asked them about how steep the slopes were and thinking about does something need to be included that includes some type of um, stabilization blankets on the slopes to make sure they stabilize quickly or what are the type of erosion control barriers around the perimeter or other things like that. They are not large structural things that would change the appearance of the plan or the layout. Yeah, and we're, okay. we are gonna do with block, segmental block wall. Um, we've got a lot of experience with putting these walls down. We we've provided a six foot um, area along the, the face of the walls um, in, in that wetland impact and restoration area, which is the, the pinch point, if you will. Um, the balance of the, the wall um, is proximate to the 35 foot restoration. So we're gonna be in that 35 foot. We're gonna be taking out invasives. We're gonna be putting down loam. We're gonna be doing some planting. So the um, there'll they'll be uh, the ability to, to jockey that. Um, Joe, Joe, you said it's six feet away from the building. How tall is the wall at that point? I think Joe, I saw on Ann's comment that it was like one to 11 foot tall uh, yeah, in general in, around the site. In that area um, where the wetland impact is, um, it, it's, it's uh, seven or eight feet tall. And it's not, okay. it, it, with the segmental block wall, if you envision it, you you put down a gravel uh, base that's nine to 12 inches uh, deep, you basically dig a trench um, to put down that gravel base and your four, first course of block goes down. And then as Ann said, there's, there's a geo grid or there can be a geo grid that goes back into the site, uh, not towards the wetlands. And you just, you're working in lifts with the geo grid, working your way up and really there's no, no reason to go you know, on the wetland side. You can work entirely from the upland side, uh, doing the geogrid, doing the backfill um, to, to, to work 
Um, we've many times immediately upon getting the first couple of courses down, put loam down um, on the wetland side, on, on the, the down gradient side and got vegetation going um, because we don't, have to, we don't have to go down there anymore. Um, so it, it can be an effective barrier uh, between the development and, and, uh, and, the, and the, the resource area. I think one of the problematic areas is, is trash that flows down there because there's no need for the workers to go down there. So it tends to, to collect and you know, the monitors have to tell them, hey, I, I just walked the perimeter and can you get down there and, and pick this, the Tyvek that blew down there and, and, and whatever. Um, so, uh, but as far as machinery and, and people going down there to, to work, uh, once, once we get that wall rising up, um, there's, there's no real reason to, to go down there. So I'm confident that we've provided enough, um, enough area there. Um, <laughs> Anne's asked for a detail, we'll, we'll get that detail uh, added so it's on the plan so that everyone can see it. Um, and, My uh, concern was not between the wetland the, the, the perimeter controls and the outside of the wall, my concern was that the distance between the wall and the building was sufficient to accommodate the geo grid on a wall of that height. Yep. Because the taller it is, the further the depth of the geo grid. No, we're confident that we can, we can do it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've even pinned the geo grid to the foundation. <laughs> when, when when we've been tight, like I, I've participated in those discussions before as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, not worry yeah. about that item. But again, uh, the as Ann said, the or requested detail on the plan um, goes a long way to making sure that everyone fully understands uh, what the. Uh, what the plan is and what and what the sequence is and how the construction will will proceed and how the uh, resource area is going to be protected okay great and so i guess my 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 second question and only other question for you is, is right now is anyway, i i agree with anika i think this has come a long way i think this is looking really good at, um what do you see, what do you see is you know, is, is the critical mitigation to make this permittable, whether it's here on the page or is it just accumulative? You know, what what's is there a, mo, a more important mitigation than than others? Is there something that sits there and says, yeah, it's great that they're doing this, but that's just nice. You know, that's that's the com the commission wants that. That's great. Let's do it. Or is it cumulative? You know, all this mitigation should be necessary, or um, or is there there one piece that is really really necessary for this to become permittable? Is that a question for me or for Ann? So that's for, for I'm looking for Ann's opinion on it. <laughs> um, well, I definitely think including the wetland replication, even though it's fourteen to one or whatever it might be. It's, you know, they're rectifying the sins of the past because it's obvious that someone dumped a bunch of fill in the wetland. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, actually managing the invasive species in the 35 foot buffer zone in the long haul will have a positive impact to the wetland as well. So I think it's going to be positive for that buffer, but I think it will have a positive impact on the wetland. I think the, mitig the mi mitigation that um, seems to have less of a correlation to the project itself is the mitigation along the bank. And I say that because not to say that it doesn't have merit or value. I know the commission asked for that and I don't wanna undervalue um, any requests from the commission but it is displaced from the work that's being proposed and there's not a strong correlation between impacts to bank or impacts to the wetland in that, air, in that area. I know at one time there was a trail that was proposed and all that kind of stuff. And I suppose if that was still on the table, there would be a stronger correlation because you would want to 
with the plantings or do, perform activities that would have a correlation to the impact associated with the trail system through the wetland. But that's not on the plan anymore. There's an easement. That was one of the things that really concerned DEP, but there's an easement there. And of course, if somebody's gonna walk through the wetlands, you're not gonna stop them. Um, and I think, you know, that there was a lot of dialogue back and forth via email amongst me and Chuck and Joe today about the bank and some comments from the department. And sometimes bank stabilization is a one <coughs> fix, but rivers are dynamic systems. Those stream banks are carved out for a reason. I haven't looked at the watershed to this, but I would venture to say it's gotta be pretty flashy when it rains, it probably just roars through there and that water passes through and then the, the stream level drops down closer to what we observed out there, which is like, you know, six, eight inches of flow. And that heavy, heavy flow erodes, erodes the banks. It's a natural process. So even if that work was perform performed, it may not be a permanent fix. One of the questions that I asked that I honestly don't know if, if Joe and them had a chance to get the answer to that I did not necessarily take into consideration is he was saying, although it, I guess it's only in certain areas, that a portion of the stream bank on the far eastern side of the bank is not on the property. So I don't think that the commission should probably be asking them to go to the abutters and ask for permission and authorization to perform work on the stream bank on their property. But, you know, this is a, it's a discretionary call by the commission. Doing this kind of restoration is not something that you throw together. It's not something that lots of people do. It does take some expertise. I think it's part of the reason why the department asked more questions about it because I think some people can be a little cavalier about, we'll just throw some cork logs in there and throw some, some seed on it and it'll just work. And it, it takes a little bit more understanding of how the river system works to ensure that it's really gonna work. And even then a large storm event could rip it all out. Okay. Plantings along the top of the slope, I don't think you know a storm event or the course of the river is necessarily going to damage or take away any improvements that those plantings at the top of the slope have. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm finally it's something I'd like to talk about. So I did see on the plan that where no physical work uh, is related to this pedestrian pathway, it's just an easement. I'm, I was always hoping that that there was a way to still have that happen. And I guess I'm disappointed that, I mean, so we just did a project in Arlington and it was <clears throat> the uh, Spy Pond Edge Erosion Control uh, <coughs> Project and it had Corfuchin throughout. And some of the comments I just heard weren't even brought up at the conservation meeting. I'm okay with, the applicant saying, look, we, this is a lot more detail and a lot more engineering than, than we thought we'd get into. But if we're gonna lose the undercutting of the stream and we're going to uh, lose the pathway and, and those two things can't be done, you know, I don't know. I mean, for, for me, I, I was hoping we would get, we would get more than just a restoration area and some monitoring and mitigation of uh, invasive species. Well, and that's part of the reason why <laughs> the hardest part of being a peer reviewer is when a commission member who has voting authority and power asks me as a peer review consultant what I think of a discretionary decision that lies solely within their discretion under their bylaw. So I do my best to walk the line and the commission's going to have to decide whether or not they think that that work is warranted 
to permit this project. And it's hard for me to answer <coughs> this question for you. So they came in originally with just a um, uh, kind of like a stone dust path. And it, um, it was brought to my attention. Uh, Mike Abel just told me just to elevate the path and it would be fine. Is, you know, obviously it's more expensive than a stone dust path, but still we get across the wetland. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, um, you know, I guess my, I'm wondering why we can't go there. That's for Joe. Yeah, if I could yeah. comment on a couple of these. Um, go ahead, Joe. With, with regard to the, the mitigation, um, we, we started this project with uh, kind of a stretch with regards to the normal, the normal process of applying to conservation commissions. We wanted to fill 1,000 2,500 square feet and put a building on it. So we came in formally to the commission and, and said, you know, we think there's an opportunity here. We think we've got a degraded riverfront. We think we've got a, a blighted site. We think we've got some, some correcting of sins of the past, if you will. Um, and the commission to, to our surprise was, was uh, very receptive and we appreciate that. We've moved through the process um, kind of in, in, in baby steps to, to move that forward. Our original mitigation was uh, predominantly the, the buffer zone, uh, the 35 foot invasive species management restoration, um, invasive species management and, and restoration. Um, and the other items, came up with regards to the, the walkway, the plantings along the bank and the stream bed and bank stabilization came up after a site walk with Chuck and, and, um, and other, other town staff when we, when we saw those things. And we added them. Um, we, we said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. We, we did have serious concerns with work directly in the stream um, because of implications of Army Corps and, and that slippery slope that of permitting that you, you would have to go through. Um, but now we are, um, we've got a different project. We've got a different impact. We've got um, going from 2,500 square feet of, of uh, kind of full blown impact and wetland impact to um, this finger like projection uh, impact, notwithstanding the incursions into your 35, I understand that. But I, I, I'd, I'd like to segregate the, the mitigation to the various impacts and say that with regards to the wetland impact at 207 square feet, we are providing this, this reclamation uh, of, a, of a fill area uh, and a very large 14 to one um, replication. So that's, we're, we're that's balanced in, in our mind. Uh, the, the incursions into the 35 uh, shown in, in dark gray, our mitigation for that was, it, or is that invasive <coughs> species management and restoration of, of the, the buffer, which is highly important to um, the wetlands itself. It's, it's not a very good buffer zone. Uh, uh, for those of, who, have, who have been out there. And that's the reason for it not being a very good buffer zone is the past activities of the, the, um, the owner of the property over the many, many years. Um, so there's a correlation there. Um, so now I guess the, the added um, mitigation that's not directly correlated to uh, I guess the project and, and the sins of the, the, the past is the work along the, the bank. And I think the, the plantings on the top of the bank go towards the impact that the um, sewer project had uh, with 
the vegetative clearing that's necessary on top of the sewer line that's that's out there. Um, and that some additional plantings between that area that needs to be continually cleared by public works for that sewer line and the, the stream channel proper was a good idea to, to bolster that. It wouldn't impact the sewer. We all have to live with the fact that this that the municipal sewer line is there and it's going to continue to be there and um and the stream so that was kind of a a project related benefit that's not directly related again to the to the to the project and the impacts of the project or or the the sins of the past and the walkway um <coughs> When when we got the pushback on on putting the stone dust in there because it's it was deemed to be impact wetland impact well beyond five thousand square feet and just couldn't couldn't happen. Um, then we came up with this idea. Well, the critical point is to get people back to that strip, and when you walk back there, uh, and many people do, there's there's a worn path. Uh, along that sewer line, it's not it's not a a marsh or a a boggy wetland. It's um, <coughs> very walkable, um, even even at, at the times of the the wet season. So while I appreciate the boardwalk idea, it just doesn't seem to fit here because. Mm -hmm. The boardwalks that I've known um, uh, that uh, have been put in, you know, nature areas, you need the boardwalk. You can't physically walk in that wetland if you are not on the boardwalk because you'd sink up to your knees or or more in in <coughs> in the muck. That's not what we what we have here. So it seems out of place to just put a boardwalk because it's wetland and it wouldn't be classified as wetland impact um because it, it it just doesn't fit we if we get people back there via the easement um and they walk along that path i, I don't see a detrimental impact to the wetland because of what it is and because of the fact that it is also coincident with this uh, sewer easement so it's you know yes it's the a, only the only yes, problem with yes, that it's, is it's not a defined it's not a defined pathway um I, I don't know. No, no, I, I, I understand. I understand. Yeah. I understand that. So, but we maybe we could maybe we could do something to to, to define it as a pathway. And, and the with, other point so, that I made is, with, is with, yeah, markers so or, or, or or something like that. The the last point, just to finish my 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 point with the stream bank stabilization is is it as Ann said, it's it's a natural phenomenon that happens in stream channels. They get undercut and it has to do with a myriad of factors that have nothing to do with the this this project, has nothing to do with the sins of the past. It has to do with the nature of the stream. Um, and my question would be is, it has it, are there other areas in in town that the town has taken that that action up because it because it's it's critical and and why is it critical what what is what is it the benefit of the the bank stabilization um because although it's undercut it doesn't seem to be something that is um it is continuing to grow and 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 the stream channel is getting wider and shallower and and all of that it seems to be a healthy stream bottom with a lot of uh, uh stop stone and cobbles and and so forth it seems hydraulically to be functioning probably and uh, properly i know the town engineer said there's there's flooding problems in other areas but i to, to me he was more talking about that because of the obstructions and the leaf and the tree falls um, and some of the, the damming from debris uh, from woody debris that was in there. I don't think his his concern about 
about helping with the with the flooding problem in the area was related to the undercutting of the, the channel. So I'm, I guess I'll close by saying, what do we really, what is the real benefit here? Um, and knowing that what, what Ann says is these can be very complicated uh, uh, projects where we you need to get in there and, and almost deconstruct the stream channel to, to then get the banks, uh, the banks done. We're, we took a simplistic approach to it to say, we'll, we'll put some, um, some cool log, uh, logs in there and stake them and seed them. And, you know, if it's, if simply, if that's the, deal then we're you know we're, we're happy to do it if we can also avoid army corps uh, jurisdiction upon a deeper look at this um you know we've got upwards of 300 linear feet of uh bank stabilization i misspoke um earlier today i, I thought the property line was down the center it's not we actually do own a, a, a good portion of both sides. Um, but anything over 100 feet in our mind uh, or our, our experience requires Army Corps. Um, uh, Army Corps, and that's just, they, they're gonna get down into the details. They're gonna wanna know um, why are we doing this? What's the benefit? What What is the, and turn it into right. a, a major. All right, major Joe. Error. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll just let you, if you've got, you know, I, I, I know do. you've got I, some thoughts the, on that. So. The bank restoration was always supposed to be beneath the trigger of Army Corps. And um, I think that's still possible. But I'm not locked in on the bank uh, repairs, the core machine, all that stuff. If, if, but I, but I am just wanted to, you know, make you guys understand that there is impact with this bank. So that undercutting is actually traveling down. And I took a, um, I took a site visit with one of the engineers uh, cross, cross street between 47 and 39. And it's all deposited in back of those properties, creating, um, like a, a silt berm and everything's getting pushed back and the properties on either side are flooding. So we are getting a lot of sediment from that, uh, you know, that first flush from every rain that's coming across the street and depositing itself on the other side of cross street. And so that's one of the reasons why it should be taken care of. But um, if it's, if it's something that we drop, uh, I guess because the project has changed, then I can gr agree with that. But I don't see how we're going to drop all this stuff if the project. No, no, and and, and yeah. we're we're not. And I just just to put it put one more piece on that. We're we're not trying to to back down to the monet to the monetary commitments. And we, we've said a couple of times here, and I'll say it again. We're we're willing to to put to make a contribution um, to the effort of stream restoration, stream bank stabilization, whatever whatever the municipality feels they, they need to do in, in the entire course um, to make a contribution uh, towards that um, so that so that if municipal funds are inadequate to, to get little projects like this done, um, there's there's extra money for it. All right. So there could be a so, compromise here in what you said, which is, so I was a little surprised when I got the email from you, Joe, saying that the product core log vendor, who I interpreted, you might need to clarify for me if they're just a seller of core logs or if they are actually someone who is has expertise in the selection process, but I was a little surprised when the when it came out as five areas totaling 300 feet. We didn't thoroughly scour this whole area. We were on the site visit, but I saw a couple areas that were significantly undercut, not just typical stream erosion, but significantly undercut that might amount to less than 100 feet. And maybe that's the compromise is that the project employs 
the effort to do 99 linear feet to stay under the Army Corps threshold and makes a financial contribution for the remainder of the work for the town to undertake it or some such compromise along that those lines. Just something for the commission to consider. And we're happy to happy to work um, work on that. And and Chuck, we're we're happy to talk more about the path and what it could be, um, what it whether it's whether it's uh, markers or maybe sections that are are more formalized. I don't you know I don't I don't know, um, but certainly we my client told me to you know not back off on the commitments and we're just trying to advise him and and educate him as to what what these commitments mean so that's why when when we were looking for a walkway and uh somebody mentioned stone dust we we added it to the plan. And now we know that we really can't do that because it would ex exceed the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission and being deemed a, you know, impacts beyond 5,000 square feet. So, um, but but certainly on on those through on those two issues, which seem to be the only ones that are that are. Um, in contention here or, or, or being discussed here let's let's see if we can come out come up with uh, a, a way to, to, to keep them keep the stuff in there and and make everybody happy but okay. allow the project to move forward sure uh, I just had one follow-up question I don't know if it was thinking uh, in this direction so when you go from um, Three story to four story. Are you still under the? And I don't know if Dave Bennett asked this question. Um, are you still under the height uh, restriction for the town or the maximum height of the town? We are. And it's that's because you're, you're digging more. You're, you're digging out more than you had been before. How are you changing the elevations to an additional story but staying under the the height? You, did so you have room? We had a we we had a three story building, and the zoning allows four story. So the zoning allows us to go to four story. Okay, so there's no height. It's just you can do four. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I did want to uh, David Cowell again before we move on from the stream. Uh, I I did have some prepared comments, and I think that Ann and Joe it, it touched upon um, uh, most of them. Um, one of the other things that I did want to mention is that when you look at a stream, if you're impacting greater than 50 square feet, it requires a wildlife habitat evaluation. That really is not a, a difficult process. It's uh, maybe a day of work. But anytime I do a wildlife habitat evaluation, one of the things I'm looking for with bank impacts is that undercutting of banks actually serves wildlife habitat. Undercut banks serve as habitat for trout, turtles, aquatic invertebrates, and uh, otter. So that, that's actually something I would put in a wildlife habitat evaluation. And then secondarily, again, to point to the merit of Joe's comments, is that if it were DPW to um, propose a, a notice of intent or something to do the work, that as a municipal entity rather than a private developer, and if they say that this is under the guise of um, stormwater maintenance or stormwater management, that there may be certain uh, exemptions afforded under the Wetlands Protection Act for the maintenance of stormwater or, or utilities that are not afforded to a private developer. Um, that doesn't necessarily absolve them from the Corps of Engineers permitting for anything uh, greater than 100 linear feet, but that's just something that, that we don't have afforded to us as, as a private developer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So at, at this point, you know, we've we've been on this for over an hour now. I, I think we, we've you guys have done a great job at catching us up. Um, you know, I, I can see that that this has come a long way. Um, you know, I, I'm at this point. I, I think rather than open up, I I think we need to to.
to move on, what, what I would ask the commission, and, and I'll open it up to the, the commission if there are significant comments, but what I would ask the commission to think about uh, as part of this next, you know, this being continued to a next meeting is what are the, the mitigations that we feel are required? And, and I think what I would ask from, I would personally ask from Ann, Chuck, and Dave and Joe is, is you know, take a look at this feedback. If, if there is significant undercutting in, in line with what Ann had said, and there are zones that we could improve upon that we see value there, but still keep this underneath the, where we're going into some sort of core requirements. I think that's, that's an op, you know an option that is laid out there, and then I, I I would agree with Chuck's sentiment of if there's whether or not it's stone dust or anything that you know, I think there are options with making this path markable um, that that could be still thought about. Um, so I, I'm going to open it up quickly to the the commission if there's a, a a major thing, but like I said, otherwise I I think at this point we we want to try to move on and you know try to address what mitigation there would be at the next meeting. Does anybody have any comments on the, the commission? I'm hearing none. Uh, Chuck and David, Joe, do, is there anything that you guys see as right now, like you need from the commission uh, that that's holding you back from, you know, having something for the for the next meeting no I, I think we've got clear direction from from man um, on on the polishing that needs to be done and the additional details okay. I think that um, you know our mar marching orders right now are to as you said see if there's 99 feet of severely undercut in need of immediate action um, and see if we can detail what the approach would be to that that stretch or a couple of stretches. Um, and, you know, I, I think we, we, we need to put our thinking caps on with regard to the, the, the walkway, the path, um, yeah. to, to see if there's something between what we're providing now, which is an easement and, uh, you know, full scale boardwalk. Okay. Uh, Mike, could you just uh, see if there's any uh, abutters that would like to ask a question? Yeah. So uh, what I would open up the public comment, um, you know, as we've been doing, if you've got a comment, please raise your hand. Bye. On the Zoom meeting. Seeing that. All right, Chuck. I'm not seeing any. Uh, yeah. So at this point, uh, I'll, does anybody on the commission have, have a motion? Anika Scanlon, I move we continue the meeting to <coughs> June 10th. Even so, um, so, so hold on, uh, it, because uh, just in line with our last one, you know, there is a possibility that we have a meeting the 27th. Uh, so I, I, at this point, I would just say that the next meeting is, as long as that's fine with the applicant, um, I'm, I'm sure they'd want to get in. Mr. Yeah, Mr. But, Chairman, if you could, if you could continue it to that, to the 27th, um, and then if the meeting doesn't happen or there's some other reason, it's, we'd be happy to, to uh, send to the continuance to the 10th. But yeah, we right. want to try to keep things moving. I make a motion to continue the meeting to the next available meeting, hopefully the 27th, otherwise June 10th. Thank you, Anika. A second. Dave Pinnett, second. Yep. Anika Scanlon. Uh, Mike Flynn in, in favor. Anika Scanlon in favor. Sorry, Mike. Mark okay. In favor. John Sullivan in favor. Dave Pinnett in favor. Great. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So, thanks, everyone. So, moving along to the the next uh, item on the agenda, we're going to open up a public hearing for RDA filed by Ryan Percival. This is the 
engine, engineering division maintenance and road repair. Um, so this is for retune, uh, routine resurfacing maintenance and road repair for 10 road rate, roadways, uh, approximately 2.1 miles of, uh, of which there's portions of work within the 100 foot buffer sure. and the 200 hey, foot buffer. Well, this, this guy wasn't making it. The guy that substitute for, I, I, I was biting my tongue here. I was got ready. Thank you, Chuck. Can you hear guys hear me now? All right. So uh, this is the roadway maintenance. Uh, this is something that comes up before us every year. Um, you know, I think we have a pretty good system here. You know, I remember last year, Chuck, when this was presented, Chuck felt like he and Ryan had a had it established. This is something that comes each way. But Ryan, I'll uh, let you take over and and just kind of let us know what what's planned. Uh, thanks, Mike. Ryan Percival, Town Running, Town Engineer. Um, like you mentioned before, this is this is nothing new. We come in front of you every year for our road paving list. Um, this one has very uh, little to no impact um, this year within any of the buffers. Um, as you can see, the best thing to probably look at would be yeah. There you go. Thanks, Chuck. Is the plan. Um, the pink area is your 100 foot buffer and then we go outside of that and we say 200 feet we're going to put in silt mandatory silt fence in those areas and you can see on winslow road we had a little piece that comes just up to that pink area um in glenmere circle all those areas will be um will have erosion control um and silt sacks and silt fabric in there uh, whatever we need in those uh, catch basins in those areas um, the one point, the one area that I really do want to touch upon um, and just bring to the commission's attention is the Mill Street area. Um, we just went through and did a water main um, improvement job out there with some cleaning and lining work. It's in some severe disrepair in certain areas. And so um, there's a portion on the upper end close to the main street that's going to call for a reclaim that's outside of jurisdiction. And then the remaining piece of it will be just a mill in an overlay um so there'll be no grading or or um any chance for any of that uh, loose gravel to wash away in that section so um i just wanted to make sure i pointed that out and so we have three streets that are going to be a mill and the remaining uh seven streets with a portion of mill street so it almost looks like eight streets but seven streets to be a reclaim which is we bring it down to gravel material grade it, compact it, and then put a binder and a top back on. And so um, usually what ends up happening before the project, Chuck and I will go out and we'll establish these areas that um, that need some erosion control and even areas that are may, might be outside of these areas that we might need to extend it to. And it's worked out great in the past. So um, just trying to keep it really brief because I know you've got a pretty big agenda here and I'm on for a couple more after this. Um, so if you have any questions, we can open it up if there needs to be any more discussion on some of the process. Uh, we can go from there. So, yeah, before Ryan, I, I open up to the rest of the commission. I, I do have a, a question, and it's in regards to Mill Street. And that, it's actually it's an old new business item later on in our agenda. But I, I don't know if this was uh, had to do with you guys, but I, I think there was a new hydrant installed out on Mill Street as well. Um, it, you know, I, I hate to, to combine things, but ultimately you're gonna be doing work in this area. I think the hydrants out in that area, um, I, I guess yeah, from my standpoint. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so from my standpoint, I would just hope that, you know, as part of this, when you're going out there with Chuck, you guys can look at that area as well as, as you know, just kind of, if it's possible to wrap it into the same thing, or if, if it needs to be handled separately, it, you know, that, that's fine. It just, I see Mill Street, I see you guys are going to be going out and looking at it. I'd, I'd like to make sure that gets addressed as well. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I've talked to Chuck about this. I mean, we're committed yeah. to taking care of what we need to out there. So um, okay. I'm not necessarily sure it'll be underneath this contract as I can't, I can't promise you that I can mix the two, but um it will be taken care of 
So we do. Okay. I know I have some running out there from some tires, um, but that'll be taken care of. Hey, Ryan, I wanted to ask if, um, and I, I'm not saying they they can't do this, but can you just let me know if they're going to use uh, the the Lobs Pond parking area for a staging area or for anything, or um, have you eliminated that as a possible staging area in this contract? I, I prefer. I prefer they don't um, stage in that area, just like I preferred that the other contractors didn't. Um, you know, we generally will stage on areas of roadway if we can. But I mean, you're looking at um, usually these are milling machines. They're not going to stay on the road. The paving machines aren't going to stay on the road. They're going to get dropped off the day of. So um, generally, you probably won't see anything stored there for more than probably 12 to 24 hours and a, a roller might be dropped off the night before but you're not going to see anything stored there so chuck i think you and i can probably work work through that and I, I mean if i get into a bind and i need to use it then we'll restore it but i really don't want them down in that area okay all right uh, -huh. uh and the and only other no, thing that's, that's, not to, that's not to say they won't use it to to do a three-point turn. So if they do damage anything, we will take care of it. Yeah, I, th I think we have some eyes out in that area. So it's gonna be um, highly visible. Yep, um, no, and, we're, and we're committed to restoring anything that we damage. Yeah. Uh, the thing, one of the things that's come up in the past is um, uh, during the many years that we've done this project is that um, when the tree lawn gets ripped up, uh, in the very beginning, you used to wait until um, a certain amount accumulated and then they were all repaired at the same time. Um, in the past, we've, you've had them fixed um, on a schedule, so we're not waiting. And what ends up happening is if that open soil uh, gets washed into the street and down into the storm drain. And that's the reason why we weren't waiting till the end of the project. Is there, is there a safeguard in your contract? Um, for, for this um, aspect of what's happened in the past? Uh, so generally speaking, uh, any sort of looming and seeding happens after the project. It has to happen after the paving goes down. Um, generally what you're talking about is we see that primarily more on the reclaimed roads is where we have a, a more of a cutting in the, into the side of the, the, um, the sidewalk area if there, if there isn't a paved surface. Um, on the milled surface, you're only milling down an uh, inch and a half, two inches. Um, so you're not really creating that sort of disturbance on the side of the road. And you're putting back exactly what you took out. So um, I think we, you know. It's usually the, the non-disturbed roads that this happens to. And were you saying that at the end of each road after it's uh, completed or at the end of the entire project, you'll go back and see? So. Keep in mind that the paving, the paving crew, you know, they have separate people. So the guys that just come out to do the paving, just do the paving. So they're not the same people. There's a restoration and punch list crew that come out right behind them. And they, they do all the handwork and things like that. It's done during that process. Um, and then we also have to catch it during time of year too, for seeding. Um, and so we can certainly be on them in areas that we need to and force it faster, um, but it, it walks yeah. a fine line with um, uh, means and methods versus erosion control. So and we do have some ability to force them to do their stormwater BMPs and to make sure that we don't have any erosion. And that's what we'll force on them. Um, I don't think we should have too many areas where we have an issue like that, but again, Chuck, if we have any issues, we'll take care of them for erosion and um, do anything that we need to, to mitigate it. And from uh, my understanding about this project, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one of your engineers is on call or act, uh, actually out there with him as the paving is taking place? Yeah, so we actually have, uh, we have some QAQC with a consultant that's out there. Um, and then we also have one of my staff or whoever's available out there, um, either watching the whole period of time or periodically, you know, five or six times. Uh, during the day because we do have a lot of projects going on but there is someone on site at all times great 
not, those are the points I wanted to bring up. Okay, Anika. Um, thanks. So in the RDA, um, Ryan, there is a mention of uh, the project might also be repairing some deteriorated catch basins. Can you just real briefly describe what exactly that looks like? What what do you typically typically run into? What kind of damage gets repaired? So, um, so when they do a reclaim on a road, they have to pull they pull the castings off, which is the metal castings on the top, and then they also have to lower down um, a couple brick courses, and then they plate them. In doing so, some of the older roadways you may have some salt damage over the years, and the mortar and the brick becomes loose, and you have some damaged corbels and things like that. So we may have to go down. Uh, more than two or three or four courses of brick and rebuild it uh, and then come up with that. The only, <clears throat> the only other piece of that that we would repair um, is if we had a total collapse of a manhole, which very rarely happens, but it does happen. Um, but more importantly, what generally happens is we um, replace all the, the catch basin grates that are deficient or broken or damaged, um, and we replace them with high flow grates. Um, that are age 20 loaded. Okay, thanks. Are there uh, any other questions from the commission? Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm hearing none. No seeing hands. Yeah. Chuck, uh, you know, I, I know this, like I said, you, you've generally said you've got, uh, you know, a pretty good comfort level in communication with Ryan on this. So, um, you know, do you have any other items associated with this? I think you were able to ask your questions, but. No, as long as we can take that, uh, you know, survey for erosion control and storm drain, silt sack, uh, prior to, you know, prior to, uh, well, in a time where it's effective for the job, I, I think that that's my only concern. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hearing that, is a, do I hear a, a motion from anybody? I want to ask the if there's any comments from the, the public. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Are there any comments from the public? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. 40 pounds. Okay. And, and, you know, I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, let me go back through this again. Go ahead, Mike. Start hey, asking people. Yeah. If, if anybody has a comment, could you please raise your hand? I... All right. I'm seeing none. Um, Understand that? Do is there a, a motion from the commission? I'm on you, muting people still, Mike. So let me just make sure I get everybody. Yeah. There's someone uh, talking in the background. I think I have all the commission members. I think so. Anika. Did I not get Anika? And Martha and John. <laughs> oh, those guys. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Couple. I think Motion. I missed John. Motion to issue a negative determination. It's Liz. He, he, John's under Liz. Oh, good. Uh, All right, and Nika put in motion on the uh, on the floor for a negative determination. David Panetta second that. All right, Mike Flynn uh, in favor. Anika Scanlon in favor. Martha Moore in favor. John Sullivan in favor. David Panetta in favor. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving along to the next item the, on the agenda. Uh, 
this is a, a continuance of a, a public hearing for notice of intent uh, filed by Ryan Percival, Town of Reading Engineering Department under Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act uh, for demolishing and replacing one existing bridge on track road. Uh, this has minor and temp uh, minor temporary and permanent impacts are proposed to land underwater and waterways, 100 year floodplain, 200 year riverfront area, and the 100 year buffer zone, 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, compensatory flood storage is provided, um, and that's in, in an area downstream. Um, this was presented uh, at our last meeting. The, the commission had comments. Um, in addition, we received comments from DEP. Uh, and my understanding, uh, Ryan, is that AECOM uh, you know, is going to to present you know, what has been done since the last meeting. Correct, uh, Chuck. If you could please, I, I do have AECOM joining me tonight. I have uh, Richard Devana, Matt Devlin, and Todd Dwyer that need to be unmuted. Yes. Um, and just just briefly, um, I'm sure Matt's going to be presenting at first to go over the response that the commission had from um, responding to some of the co comments that you had from the last meeting, and then they'll probably touch upon some of the comments from DEP's letter. Oh, yes, this is Matt Devlin from AECOM. Um, at the last meeting, um, we were asked to look at reducing or eliminating uh, the rock fill on uh, the stone riprap that's basically along the slope. Um, we took a look at that. Um, there are slope structure stability and reliability issues with removing it completely. So we did um, reduce the amount of riprap. So basically the riprap will remain in the lower to mid portions, but we did remove it from the mid to upper portions. What we did was we replaced that with a um, basically fiber core log called bio blocks. Uh, they're pretty beefy blocks um, that'll serve to reestablish the slope um, using more uh, softer bioengineering um, methods. Um, so that's what we did look at and also proposing some erosion control blankets, similar uh, core um, coconut fiber um, erosion control blankets that would extend up the slope as well. Um, we are going to be using um, repeating the area uh, using New England conservation seed mix with a mix of annual rye. The annual rye will take quicker. I've found that the conservation mix is good long term, but stability right away is kind of slow to react. So we're putting in an annual rye that won't grow back. It's just that first uh, year um, just to initially stabilize things. We're also going to be proposing to plant um, in between each level of the bio blocks um, using tublings and beb willow, which is sort of more of a drought tolerant species. Um, we're choosing tublings over the live stakes just because of time of year. Basically live stakes are generally only available during the dormant season from about mid November to mid March. And since this is gonna be more of a summer, mid summer, late summer construction, we're going tublings. Um, we're also going to be putting in um, in the top portions of the slopes um, shrubs. We've got three shrubs of blueberry, three shrubs of arrowwood, and also we are going to be cutting down um, two trees and replacing those two red maple trees as well um, on each side of the bank. We did provide a cross-sectional detail that was also requested at the last hearing. Um, so that's part of the submission package. It gives a cross-sectional view of the slope, the bio blocks, the plantings, um, the material that's gonna go in there. Um, and then in the response letter, we also provided the new impact calculations. Um, so we have provided that as well. And then um, just running down my list here of uh, what was discussed at last time. And then also what was requested was a detail for the planting of the trees and shrubs on the slope. So in our, in our package, we have a detail sheet that shows the um, plantings both on the flatland and on the slopes themselves. Um, those are the, the main issues that were discussed. 
Um, before I get into the DEP letter, um, let me we talk about um, those portions of the um, from the last hearing in that discussion. I'll uh, open it up to the commission if there's any questions uh, on that aspect. Chuck, do you have any questions in regards to that? I, I don't, but I but I did. I was wondering about uh, the DEP letter um, and how yeah. how the applicant plans to proceed with. With yeah. That. So, so Matt, if you could, could just kind of address the DEP level for for those that weren't able to. I know Chuck's put it up on the board here, but for for those that aren't weren't able to actually see this or public that's watching, could you just explain kind of the, you know when you when you're going through the comments, what, you know what the comments were, um, and, and you know and what how you plan to address them. Sure, yeah, um, we did address the comments in the letter. I, I'll run through them. They're sort of um, just a run on in the letter themselves. So in the response letter, I actually broke them out um, by bullet item. Um, just bullet item. Um, so basically the first one was, it's not clear why the project was filed under the unlimited projects for the, for the roadway and why wasn't it just a stream crossing? Um, it can be technically both. We did file it under the roadway, but it can certainly be part of the stream crossing um, limited project as well. So we did note that, that it could be both in this response. Um, also what was asked was um, the um, how we met the stream crossing standards and trying to use a open bottom box culvert in, or an arch instead of the four-sided culvert. Um, so we did um, mention <coughs> about the openness ratio. We met the screen crossing standards for embedment, openness ratio, and substrate. So we talked on these items at the last hearing as well, um, how we're going to be putting it, you know, we meet the openness ratio more than the optimum standards. We're going to be putting in the natural bottom substrate consisting of the two feet of aggregate. Um, and then the, um, the mitigation measures um, will be, you know, are also going to be included turbidity curtain, erosion and sedimentation controls, seeding and planting. Basically, the use of the three sided box culvert um, is because of the depth of the superstructure. Um, we just can't put in a arch or a three sided box culvert. So like we said before, we're gonna be putting in the four-sided that'll have the embedment and the natural stream bottom that'll function just like a span. Um, so those, those were the issues there. So we do meet the stream crossing standards. Um, basically the next item that was discussed was it's not clear what the existing and proposed culvert dimensions are. So in the response letter, we provided that on um, the dimensions there. Um, about 10 and a half feet wide, 25.5 feet in length. Um, so they're, they're laid out there. I won't go all through the numbers. You can read them there. Um, and then the next question was back to the openness ratio. Um, we did state this in the, in the notice um, that we did meet the openness ratio and here it provides the, the numbers that correlate back to the stream crossing standards and also um, you know, how, you know, how we arrived at that openness ratio. Um, the next one was a log longitudinal profile, um, hydraulic analysis report. So we did attach about an 82 page, or not an 82 page, but it was about 60 pages um, of a hydraulics analysis report. So we did previously look at that. We did not include that initially in the notice, um, but that a lot of that information was contained in the no rise evaluation that we had already previously prepared and put in the notice. We did, as part of this package, submit the hydraulics report. Um, and then the next one was further explanation about the bypass, um, the size of the pipe. And so there's some description there. We are going to be using a 36 inch culvert. Um, they, it comes down to sort of more means and methods. And at this point, we don't have a contractor. Um, so we did get into that a little bit. And we also did provide a control of the water specification that we're anticipating the contractor will follow. Um, and so the 
bypass pipe, um, you know, will meet the PFS requirements of that stream. And we sort of go through that a little bit as well. Um, about the next paragraph down from the red uh, circle. Um, we talk about that, yes, and through that area. Um, and then I'm just going through here. And then- so, uh, uh, Matt, yeah. Matt, just on that one, when you say it will meet the requirements of the stream, for what what flow? You, you say median flow. Yeah, That's so just the normal. The diameter corresponds to 24 CFS, and maybe Rick um, Devana can speak to more of this. But basically, the medium the median flow is you know, three C CFS, and the average flow is five. This 36 inch culvert is going to correspond to 24 cubic feet per second worth of flow. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's okay. you know it's it's adequate. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all, Rick, or if uh, Mike, that's sufficient enough for you, or. Um... So uh, uh, I, I guess the question is, so 24, what, is, what does that correspond to uh, in regards to, you know, what, what typical type of flow event is that, uh, would that be considered, you know, you, you've got median and average flow here, but is that a, a 10 year flow? Is that a one year flow? Do you have an idea of like what, what a event would cause that 24 to exceed that 24? I personally, I'm not the engineer on it. I don't know what um, typical storm event a 24 inch. All I do know is 20 yeah. CFS would it, it, one percent of the time. Um, a, a two year flood, a two year flood is 30 is about 35 cubic feet per second. Uh, okay. well, that's a that, that's a little bit less than that, but you know, you're talking a two year flood event. And in the specifications, we, uh, under the water control, we, we give them some guidance as, again, this is just suggested uh, as means and methods, but we give uh, 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 guidance on uh, between the periods of June and September of uh, what the uh, percentage of exceedance is over that period of time. And I think, I think with a, uh, the, the 24 cubic feet, it's, it's like uh, 1%, something like I don't remember exactly. So it's pretty, 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 you know, which is about two days in that, that period, you know, over that period of time. I, I can pull up that spec and, and uh, if, if you want a little more exact on that, but. No, but so I guess, I mean, this is in line to a, um, I think a comment that I had last time, but, but I think you, you, you talk about it in the last sentence here that, that you're going to include a five to 10 day look ahead. You know, there's, there's going to be methods, you know, I, I think I forget what you had said, but it was a short period of something like five or six days that the, it was the, the bypass is actually going to be in use from the time that they excavate to the time that they get the culvert in to, to when you could have flow, correct? That, that's right. And then, and we did add that we did under the water control specification, we, we did include a requirement for the, uh, the contractor to provide the five to 10 day uh, look ahead uh, okay. for that. Okay. I think Mike's talking, but I'm not hearing what he's saying. Yeah, I'm not hearing him either. Sorry, I put you on mute. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, I think you, I, I didn't mean to interrupt the, while you're in the middle of those comments, but if you want to go ahead on to the next one, go right that's ahead. Fine. That's, more than, that's more than fine to, to tackle them while we're here. Um, yeah, so the next bullet item was uh, revising the plans to show exactly where the wetland resource area impacts were, both temporary and permanent which we had done previously, um, but we revised the plans, obviously, for any changes that were made um, and also quantified those in the, the new revised impact table. Um, so those are, those are shown both in the plans and in the table. Um, and then the next bullet item was the rock fill should basically be eliminated. Um, we discussed that on the first bullet item for the conservation um, discussion about, you know, we reduced it, we couldn't completely eliminate it. 
Um, we did in, incorporate some soft solutions and geotextile products um, in that design. And then the also the last bullet item was um, about the Army Corps of Engineers and if we would need a general permit. And yes, we will need a self-verification notification form um, under general permit 10, which is for linear transportation projects. And we will be submitting that. Um, we do qualify for that since our cumulative temp and permanent impacts will be less than 5,000 square feet. Okay. Chuck, with that in mind, um, do you have, you know, I know you said you wanted to, do you have any other questions or do you have uh, things that you? I do, I, I wanted to go through the list from uh, DEP and I'm satisfied yeah. with those answers. Uh, and uh, we did, I did go out to the site. Uh, I went out there with a uh, commission member on uh, Scanlon and we looked, we looked around um, and I actually, I just wanted Anika to bring up uh, her points first. And then after that, I might, I might have some to add, but I, generally uh, I think the one thing we were, we were wondering about is um, where, the hundred year flood is and where the old bridge uh, is reflected in the old bridge, there's elevation. Okay. Anika, do you have any uh, questions? Sure, well, I'll just uh, jump in. Um, so as Chuck mentioned, um, I did a site visit over there um, to this particular site and um, I took kind of a close inspection of um, the cement wall that is currently creating um, the upstream channel um, and the existing culvert. And you could see looking at that wall sort of where a typical high water line was. And a, a couple of people who walked by um, who were self-proclaimed long-term residents over there, um, I asked them a couple of questions. I, I said, you know, how high have you seen the water in this um, channel? And I said, have you ever seen it over top the road? And they said, no never seen it do that. And what they had seen for a high water level was approximately the elevation of the upstream low level wall. And for those who've been out there, um, <coughs> hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Um, because upstream, there's a lower wall that ramps up as you head towards closer to the road. Um, and just looking at this project, it became extremely obvious to me, just observing that um, the amount of uh, slope steepness is a major issue here. Um, and slope stability is even though this is a low discharge stream. So you wouldn't expect to see the same type of erosion that we were talking about in a previous uh, hearing. Um, you, you're still talking about some extremely steep banks um, that need to be um, fortified and, and paid attention to. Um, I acknowledge the fact that, you know, the applicant put um, replaced um, <clears throat> a, a entire riprap um, embankment with half riprap. <laughs> um, and I appreciate that effort. I wish there was, um, I wish there was some method that could make it 
a no riprap embankment, um, but I did see on the downstream side of the existing culvert places where uh, the high wall has seen scour around the outside and significant scour. So I do understand that the downstream side of the bridge, you know, this culvert is going to need some, some more solid stabilization. Um, in terms of questions, I'm, I don't have a lot of them right now, except for um, maybe a, you know, a slightly better understanding about the um, dewatering. Um, and I know you guys have talked, said that it, it goes into means and methods, um, but I think some details can be nailed down here that make it into the bid spec. Um, especially if they're important. Um, so that's, I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay, and the response letter to um, DEP um, mentioned that a little bit as well. We did discuss or elaborate on that again in the response uh, to DEP's comment. Um, I can find what bullet item that is. And uh, we tried to summarize, you know, you know what anticipating what the um, contractor may do relating to dewatering. Um, let me try to find that. So it's on. Um, so on right the letter, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Right there, it's right in the middle of the page. Right, you know, a suggested bypass is shown in the plans right there. So, um, we, we kind of outlined for them w what our anticipated uh, procedures would, would be. Um, <coughs> uh, so, prior to any 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 demolition, you know, <coughs> they can demo. They can do demolition of the top part of the structure. Um, uh, you, you know, before they excavate down too far, but then, then, uh, so before, before they, uh, demo, re remove the lower part of the structure that they would install the bypass pipe that we're suggesting the 36 inch, uh, it's, it would be gra it's gravity, a gravity feed. Um, and, and, uh, once they, uh, once they have that in operation, they, they can proceed to uh, to remove the uh, lower half, the rest of the structure, and uh, and they they would probably they'll they'll have on site. I would imagine at, at that time the the uh, existing uh, structure uh, precast units, which is basically made up of of two U shapes, shape for the bottom and one and and you shape for the top. And uh, so, you know, once they, you know, perform the demolition, you know, they'll, you know, they'll have to prepare the bed uh, for, the, for the, the new culvert, uh, put, get the crushed stone down and, uh, and, and then install the, the, the bottom half of the, you know, the bottom half units. And once those, once those are in place and, and, and then that also allows them to Put in the, uh, the the two feet of uh, of bed material within the within the culvert, and uh, once they have that in place, um, th they have the option at that point, uh, you know, depending on their look ahead, uh, thing like that, that they they could um, uh, eliminate that bypass piping and and uh, or they could switch it, they could switch it over to inside the culvert half on one side, half on the other, or they could use the culvert itself um, for the, the, the water control, um, or, they, or they can wait 
depending on the time and, and get the top sections uh, up in, in place. But the, the, the trick is really getting the bottom half, the bottom sections of that, of the culvert in place. <coughs> and then, so that, that's the objective of the bypass piping to uh, get them by that point. So it, it, it says, um, the, the coffer dam shall be discharged, uh, shall be at the discretion of the selected contractor. So, you know, means and methods. I think the commission has asked that we could just insert something into the order of conditions that says we need to review and approve once um, the engineer department has um, the means and methods of what the, how they're going to do this. Yeah, and in our first sentence there, we do indicate that a stream bypass and water control plan will be prepared and submitted to the commission for review and approval. If that first sentence there states that. I think that would be adequate. Um, Anika, do you feel that that at least we'll be looking at what they're proposing? Yeah, we definitely need to look at what they're proposing because it, it sounds like based on what I've heard that uh, any number of things could be done. And we, we need to have a really good understanding of how this is gonna happen and what's gonna happen. Yeah, and review, review and approval is, uh, is great. That's exactly, uh, if we don't have anything in front of us now, we, should, we do need to approve. Okay, great. Um, Mike, are you there? Let me see if Mike is. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Any uh, any I've... other questions from the commission? <laughs> Go ahead, Martha. Um, Anika was asking a lot of questions about um, maximum water flow and things like that. And in the slide show, they sent out for the municipal vulnerability program for next week. They're talking about um, one of the areas in flooding in town is track road at line road. And said three bridges that impede flow and location of beaver blockage. Is that a different part of track road not connected to this part? This is not the same area they're worried about flooding for that program next week. Uh, Ryan Percival here. Uh, no, that's the, this is the same area. And again, um, we did a, a change study on that whole uh, watershed area and identified high level, um, um, high flow watermark areas and things like that. Um, we did have, we have substantial beaver activity in that whole stretch of Walker's Brook. Uh, Chuck knows exactly what I'm talking about because we have to ask permission to take the beaver dams out occasionally. Um, so th those are areas of, of uh, high flow. I mean, they, they do, that channel does serve as a main drain in town. Um, and so we're aware of that, but I mean, it's important to keep in mind that we are increasing the openness ratio, ratio and also increasing the volume that can actually go through these bridges and taking out, um, some catchment areas that we have underneath the bridges as, uh, we have a pipe that goes directly through the cross section of the, uh, bridge channel, um, that was going to be removed too. Um, so we're making a lot of, um, a lot of improvements to the to that channel. Okay, that was going to be my question: is, is will it have more capacity for water than it does now? And it sounds like the answer is yes. Yes, and and Matt, I don't know if you want to add on to that, but I mean, we did go through. I think we increased the uh, the volume that can go through there. Yes, yeah, so you all, and we also have a floodplain compensation area as well downstream. Too. Correct. Yeah, the, the original structure is 10 feet wide and, and we've 
you know, we've increased it a little bit. Uh, it's 10 foot uh, to 10 and a half feet. It, it does have a, a, a little larger opening than, than the uh, existing structure. And uh, a, a no rise was done. Uh, actually, it's part of the, and it actually, it actually shows that the flood goes down a little bit. I, I mean, it's like a, it's like a hundredth, but you know, it's it's kind of negligible. But but it just you know, it, it's. Um... Richard, the the flood compensation now that is beyond the other two bridges. Is that correct? Yeah, that's all. That's over on on the other tra Trask Road loop, loops around. So we call track. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. East. Um, are are there any downstream impacts associated with having better flow through this culvert at those other two bridges? Did did the H and H study carry it uh, down that far? Uh, I'm sorry. What was the question? The original. The so original is, it, is actually for both bridges, because um, both bridges were originally part of the whole entire notice of intent, and we had we're just going to be doing this this bridge here. But initially, both bridges were involved, so we had done the study that looked at the entire um, section of of both bridges. So yes, we did okay. look at the downstream bridge as well. Yeah, that very, was very, so. Very so simple. Matt, Matt, sorry. Just to, if if you could explain that a little bit more. So you that was part of the H and H study that that it would be improved. Is, is that correct? Yes, yes. They did look at both bridges, and there was basically a no <laughs> rise um, certificate issued in in that report, indicating that there was going to be no significant uh, rise in in flood stored capacity. Um, from the projects, and that was including both bridges initially. And okay. here we're doing the one bridge. Okay. Is that, uh, is this area here in between the first, between this bridge and the middle bridge, or between the middle bridge and the last bridge? Well, the middle bridge is not involved in this project at all. I think that's even another road. I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, but it's, not a track, it's not a track road bridge. So this is the farthest downstream bridge on so track road from the north. Harvest and is yeah. that track again? Yeah, so harvest yeah. is not included. That's the middle bridge. And okay. up here where this floodplain compensation area is going, that's the northernmost bridge. Um, it's it's be, but it's between harvest and track, the second track road. Yeah. Yes, Matt Ryan. Okay. I think so. Yeah. I do want to comment about this um, restoration area, Chuck. I think when you and I were out there, I think a car was parked um, in that area, wasn't there? Um, no, so the, the restoration area is, if, so it's, it's the furthest most bridge, it's, it's closer oh. to Cumberland Farms. Oh, so oh. never mind. We went to the last bridge and then went to Harvest, it's in between that area. That's what I'm hearing from Ryan. Okay, thanks. So... Are there any other questions from the commission? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, Ryan, if if um, the procedure to get that's a sewer pipe that goes across the the bridge. Yeah. Is is that work happening already? And when, with even with this delay that we're in now, are you expecting to get this uh, going this year? This uh, that's the end. That's the intent. Yeah, I mean, we have funding available for it already. We've we've already um, received the grant for the for the bridge. So, if everything goes through, 
um, with conservation, uh, then we would probably turn around and start getting this out for bid. And then somewhere in between then and when the awarding of the contract happens, that sewer will be relocated by DPW staff um, to go the opposite direction. Um, so that hasn't happened yet. And it's getting a little tricky because we're in, we're in the COVID situation. So um, hopefully things turn around a little bit soon and uh, the timing works out. Ryan, can you comment about, I may have asked it in the last meeting, I'm sorry. Um, I'll ask it again if I did. When you're hoping to get bids out on this? Well, our goal has always been to meet the time of year restriction. So um, it'll be, you know, we're, we're coming into the time of year restriction starting in June, you know, getting getting closer towards July, August is probably ideally where we would want to see this construction happen. So um, we'll back it off from there and see where we can get with the bid. So somewhere around uh, June, I would say, right, Rick? Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah, the bid. We well, need a 30 day notice, right? Right. I mean, we, so yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then we'd have to back it out from there. But ideally, we, we're shooting for that July, August time frame of during the dry season. Okay, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I want to know who has the ancient mouse that keeps on clicking. <laughs> I, I'm looking at I'm looking at Anika. It's not old. Uh, it's not me. No. It just uh, when I said that, you just had a, this look, this smile on your face. <laughs> yeah, because I've been hearing it too. Yeah. I don't know who that is, but it's annoying to listen to in the meeting. Hi, Dave. Just saying. Hi, right, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so is that you, is that you, Chuck? I don't know. Let yeah. me try. Yeah. Anything happening? No. Um. I don't know. All right. So we so, uh, need to move on to if there are no other questions. Yeah, Mike. Let's just keep going. Yeah, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm interested to see it. I mean, at this point, you know, where do we stand on this? I mean, uh, or do we see open items? Um, what, so, what's the, go ahead, Chuck. I would say that um, let's hear from, I, I know there's one person with a hand up uh, in the audience and maybe we could go through there and then think about any open items and get back to the commissioners. Uh, so open it up to the public, John, looks like you put your hand up. Uh, if you could please state your name and, and address and you can address the commission. Sure, um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, my name is John Barmoy, I live at 16 Track Road, Reading. And uh, so okay. yeah, bear with me, this is my first attempt attending one of these. So. Um, Got me some layman's slack here. Uh, any, any super questions? Um, so my first question, this, this kind of came up and I think was already answered, but um, it was mentioned how in the report, I think slides, uh, page slide 73, there's two bridges that were being mentioned as part of this report that was done. However, this proposal is only for the bridge depicted on slides 55 to 60, which is the only functional bridge currently in operation. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so the other bridges that are, I'm not, not even though I live here, I can never, I don't know about the east west, the ones closer towards um, Cumberland Farms, those bridges are not included in any way as part of this particular proposal, correct? Correct. Okay, and then in the 100 year floodplain that, as was mentioned, goes past that final bridge, I think. A member of the commission mentioned that they walked and saw like a car parked at the end of the one bridge and the floodplain is further up towards 
Cumberland Farms that kind of stretches across like the roundabout and, and down that way. That's that's where that refers to from a, I guess, picture perspective. What is, I guess, as a resident, what does that mean to me who lives kind of right next to that? How is, is this going to have any impact in my day to day in terms of the water flow, my water table, anything like that? Or is that not something that I would see? So, so this is the flood compensation that's down beyond the, the Harvest Road Bridge between the, the two. Right. I think it's on, yes, yeah, slide 18, paragraph four, the small portion of the 100 year floodplain bordering Yada. Yeah. Yeah, those, those are, uh, keep in mind, those are one one foot contour. So it looks it looks like more disturbance than it is. But um, Matt, how, do, how much is that uh, compensation that's there? I think the, the width, um, like that bar scale is shown there is eight feet to the right of the top right corner is an eight foot width. So it's, it's, you know, 10, 12 feet wide. It does look a lot larger on the plan. Um, but if you look at the little bar scale there on the far right corner, that, that total width is eight feet. Yeah, so it's essentially what it ends up doing is it, it will, instead of being such a steep slope, it will flatten it out a little bit more and create more of that storage volume in that banking. Okay. So, John, just to, to kind of give you the the reasoning behind it, is we see, so down at the bridge, there's area within the 100 foot floodplain that is due to slope stabilization being filled now as part of that what what gets required is compensation uh you know the, the pro any project not just this one is not allowed to fill within the 100 foot floodplain because when you do that you're taking out flood capacity you know the idea is that we want these streams to have that flood capacity uh so the the purpose of this is to help increase the and, and return to, to normal that that capacity for any filling that that was done to stabilize the slopes. Okay. Um, guys, could could you just re refresh me? What is the ratio of um, uh, co uh, compensation that that is being provided here? Or sure, if you just bear with me one second, I just want to look at the impact table. Um, borderline yeah. terms of flooding impact area is going to be 320 cubic feet and re uh, restoration compensation is going to be 394 cubic feet. So it's a smaller area square foot wise because it's 300, 462 square foot of impact and only 436 for compensation. But the cubic feet is 320 impact versus 394 uh, compensation. And that's provided on that impact table, table one on the second page of the uh, response document. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's that all sounded pretty good. But again, that's I was Googling uh, some of those terms a minute ago. So I guess I really can't comment on that. But thanks for answering my question <laughs> in, a, in a way that I could follow at least the, the gist of it. So, um, and I think one of my last questions, um, and again, you know, if I read correctly, this the, the proposed bridge is going to be twice as wide as the existing one. Is that correct in terms of having two two vehicles instead of just one being able to pass? Yeah, about that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that, I mean, this, I don't know if this is the right form for it, but, you know, from a safety perspective, is there any concerns regarding the increased flow of traffic? You know, it's a very residential, it's a tight fit right there now anyway. Is that anything that's part of this overall process or, you know? Yeah. It's basically the, 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 the minimum standard for uh, uh, MassDOT, so is the, is the um, 24 feet, so that's, that's really how that, that was set, um, but I mean the, the traffic volume there is pretty low, so I'm sure there's no, uh, you know, no, no issues there, but it, it was basically just the, it, we certainly wanted to widen it because it was basically a single lane less than that. So, no, so we fit. went to the minimum standard. Sure. No, my daughter tries to reach over those uh, boarded up slats that are right there right now. So it's, uh, I know what you're yeah. talking about. And yeah, we talked about the, the beavers already, so I'm good there. Um, and I think that pretty much answers all of my, my questions. Um, I will mention just because it did come up on that side of a line road, there definitely are some, um, puddles that collect from a water collection perspective in the in the spring and summer it's a huge 
um, nesting ground for mosquitoes. So neither here nor there, but since you were on, it came up, I had mentioned that in case anyone can take a look at that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, any other uh, questions from uh, about this, uh, this project? Just raise your hand. And Mike, um, I think we should try to unmute and see. Sure, go ahead. Any, uh, does anyone have another question that may live uh, in the uh, track road area? Hearing none. Okay. So, uh, Chuck, I guess as you see, I mean, what, what do we have left here? Or I'm, I'm, I'm asking that to the whole commission, really. Um, but you know, what are the items that we see are open at this point? I think that if everyone's satisfied with the answers that we received um, from the DEP email, and if Matt feels like uh, the department will be satisfied with those answers, then I'm satisfied. Yeah. And this project is. Right. It was it was a leading question because I think I, that was my that's my take as well. I guess. Uh, it, uh, is there anybody else in the, the commission that has anything? Sure. So Matt, do you think, Matt Devlin, do you think you'll um, uh, be able to, do you, do you think you answered um, Pam's questions thoroughly enough that uh, we're beyond uh, I don't know, receiving a uh, superseding order? Yes, no, I, I do. Um, she did respond back just indicating she received it and thanked me. Um, I didn't hear back any follow-up questions. Um, so I guess I took no news as good news. Um, assuming she knew about the hearing coming up tonight in anticipation for that, hopefully she would have uh, you know, courtesy to respond back in time. I'm not sure. But yes, I know. I think we more than adequately uh, provided sufficient information to uh, close the hearing tonight. Uh Matt, did you um, modify? I mean, I'm looking at this here, and I knew um, Commissioner Scanlon was asking about uh, eliminating some of the riprap. Is this what we're seeing here, or where is that section where you tried to address yeah. her yeah, concerns? That is, that is the section. That's the detail that shows you. Um, you know, cross-sectional view of the of the slope. So the riprap is the lower portion, and then it shows how the bio blocks are within the upper portion or mid to upper portions. And that's also shown on the plan view. It's harder to obviously see on the plan view section, but this does show a good schematic of what uh, the cross section look will look like. Okay. That's Mike. That's. Uh all I can think of. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, my take would be at this point, you know, I don't, I don't see uh, an action, you know, I don't know if there's a substantial reason to, you know, I think, Chuck, you have what you need to start uh, an order of conditions um, for the next meeting. I don't know if there's a desire to keep this open just from the standpoint of, Let's see, you know, I think we're, we're all both both the town, ACOM, the, the commission's all better off that we don't have a superseding order. Um, and so maybe it's, it's better to leave this open just from the standpoint of if there is issues that Pam brings up, um, we've got the opportunity to, to address it. I, so I don't know if there's a reason to keep it open from that standpoint. I mean, I, we can certainly, the commission can, can discuss that. Um, if it's closed and just not issued. So, um, you know, but otherwise, I don't know that we have any other direction for the, the town. Mm. So, 
I guess with that in mind, I, I, I'm open to if there's a, whether this is a, a motion to, to close or a motion to, to continue understanding that you know, Chuck has some, you know, we're giving Chuck some direction to start getting an order of conditions prepared. What are your thoughts, Chuck? I, I always, I, so when we're closing, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. the applicants would like us to close. I, I never think it's an issue because at the next meeting, we can always close an issue. I'm just, as long as you I, direct me to write the order of conditions. Uh, I, if you feel I like agree. you want to wait for Pam's possible comments, uh, I don't think we're losing anything by, by doing it that way. I, I would agree. I, I think that's, I guess my take, that's the best approach. Yeah, I, I think you've got direction to, to start preparing the order so that we can, can have it for our next meeting. So no time lost either, either way. Right. So we may have that meeting on the 27th. So that would be even better for the engineering department. Yeah. Okay, We're looking for a motion. I move we continue um, notice of intent for track road to May 27 or June 10, whichever we get the green light to do next. Do we hear a second? Second by Martha Moore. Uh, Mike Flynn, Chair, in, in favor. Anika Scanlon, in favor. Martha Moore, in favor. John Sullivan, in favor. David Finette, in favor. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Ryan, are you are you still there? Um, Chuck, is there a, is there a difference in uh, the way? I don't want to rewind and we spin this. It, it, can we vote a different way and allow them to actually uh, get started putting this thing out to bid? Um, is this going to preclude them from actually being able to put this out to bid? In other words, can we vote a different come way? Up to allow them to put this out to bid? That didn't come up to me. I don't know what time frame they're in. Uh, I, I'm sure they're gonna uh, move forward on their schedule anyways. Okay. Uh, but without this being written, there's nothing we can do. We're not losing any no. time. That's, that's what I explained to Mike and the rest yeah, of the Yeah, we're not issuing, we're not issuing until next meeting no matter what, so. As long as it's prepared in between the meetings, there's no harm. Right. Okay. All right, Ryan, are you, are you still there? Let me see, try it now. I'm still here, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear you, Ryan, yeah. All right. Uh, can we move quickly on um, just if Ryan can just give us an overview of the Grove Street project. And yeah. this is a project that uh, is coming in under the stormwater no. permit. No, water and sewer general what? water condition. The water and sewer general permit. Yep, Okay. correct. So I have that on the agenda. DP file number 2700315. Uh, orders of conditions in the threes are, are, are old, but I provided the order of conditions to the commission to review. And um, Ryan wrote up a brief uh, summary of the project and uh, turn it over to Ryan right here. And then we can ask him his questions. Uh, just to make sure that it qualifies for the existing permit. So, uh, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's general maintenance on our, well, 
what we would call general maintenance on our water mains that extends down Grove Street. I supplied Chuck with our set of plans. Um, we're doing a cleaning and lining project from basically Meadowbrook Golf Course down to about Stroud Avenue on the 12-inch water main. And then the existing six inch water main, which is undersized, um, will be upgraded to an eight inch cement line, ductile iron pipe to just about the town line down Grove Street. Uh, generally the area of impact will be of concern to you would be around the Stroud Avenue area where we do have some, uh, we're within the, uh, the wetland buffer there. In that area, we on the plan that I submitted to Chuck, uh, we're requiring fill fence and waddles in that area. And any catch basins up and along this whole entire stretch will will have um, built the fabric uh, or uh, tilt back control on them. Um, I don't anticipate much disturbance. Again, this is uh, we're ripping up the existing water main and replacing in place, and we're we're putting down by temporary bypass to uh, to basically uh, keep all the houses up and running during the project. So it's very similar to to what we've done on Main Street, which fell under the permit as well. And um, again, the area of concern would be around that Stroud Avenue area um, on the, you know, what we would call that, the northern side of Grove Street. Yes. Yeah, if you zoomed in on that plan that you're on right now, Chuck, uh, I'm on that second, yeah, down at the bottom. You'll see that it's it's delineated down there for waddles and built fences. Um, and again, that's even in a stretch where the dotted line is where we're cleaning and lining. So there's no excavation except for access holes somewhere around where the uh, fire hydrant would be. And then then we get into uh, main replacement right at Stroud Avenue and on. So uh, completely within the roadway, the existing roadway. Completely within the roadway, correct, yeah. So uh, Anika Scanlon has her hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks. Ahead, do you, um, Ryan, what do you think about maybe putting up some other um, erosion, additional erosion control um, down slope of Golf Meadow building right at the beginning there? Well, like what's the curbing like on that part of Grove Street? Is it? Is it? Uh, There's no curb. Or? There's no curb. No curb. Because just sort of remembering the topography, I I don't think. I think so the low spot the, is south of that starting point. Yeah. Yeah. So and, this, and you get and it's wetland. here. Yeah. This section here, the dotted section here, is the cleaning. What we what we uh, call cleaning and lining. So it's only done with access pits. Um, every, depending on how far they want to go, it's usually like 700 feet, 300 to 700 feet. Um, and they scrape it clean and then they line it. So there's no excavation except for those, um, access pits. access pits. So you're very limited on your, on, on the amount of, um, sentiment that you're going to be sending out. Cause as soon as they make those access pits, they plate them. So, um, Okay. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can, I can drive it, we can drive it with Chuck too, if, if he feels as though we have to extend the erosion, we can, we can extend the erosion. It, it may um, be, it may be a call Chuck makes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, when we went out there and really drove it, if, if you drive it, we, we sort of felt, I felt as though we covered probably more than we had to on the, um, on the section. And again, if we have to extend it down, we will. To protect those areas um okay. that's that's not a problem yeah i i'd personally be comfortable with you know treating this much like we do the the road if you can drive it with chuck and take a look at the areas and kind of come to agreement if they if it chuck if that that is an area that needs it because i'm remembering the same thing anika that it will drain to the south there but ultimately if it's just pits maybe it's not but you know, Chuck, you can, if you can drive it with them, you can make that call. That's real easy. Yep. I suspect the rest of the street is fine. Although I haven't driven yeah, I mean, near. I mean, we uh, do. So 
the town line in a while. Yeah, we do have on the, um, when you get close to that town line on the, uh, probably what I would call the, I don't know what side, I, and I'm not looking at the north arrow, but I think it's the south <coughs> side of Grove Street. Um, so on the even side of the houses there, there, there is a wet, you, you do have wetlands back there, but um, it's quite a distance away. Um, would be virtually zero impact from the, the construction. Okay. But we can again. We can drive. I don't. I don't mind driving that with Chuck. We'll. We can put it wherever we need to. We can just send that fabric. All right. All right. Sounds. Are great. there any other questions from the commission? Didn't hear none. Uh, hear a motion in regards to this on the general permit. I move we approve this work under the general permit. By your second? I'll second that motion. Mike Flynn, in favor? Anika Scanlon, in favor? Martha Moore, in favor? John Sullivan, in favor? David Pinnett, in favor. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Okay. I'm just so looking over have... the people here. I think Tom Wise is next on um, Tom Wise is here for, we actually closed and issued his permit, but we asked him to come back with a more detailed planting plan. Um, and I will pull that, what he sent me up uh, as soon as I can. Tom, you get the Perseverance Award. Thanks for sticking with us. This is the second meeting in two nights and tomorrow's is going to be ex exceptionally long as well. So <laughs> is, that, uh, is that up or do I need to? Hope to see you. No. It's not up? Okay. Nope. I mean, uh, okay. There we go. There you go. Okay. Great. Yeah, uh, we'll try and keep it short. And, what's that? I was just going to shrink it down. We're just all set. Go for it. Try and keep it short and sweet, um, considering the hour. Um, on the outskirts, you see the fencing. That's the fencing of the yard. Uh, the actual, remember from the previous drawings, the actual plot, plot line goes a little further to the left of that fencing. So we'll leave a lot of the stuff outside the fence that's there that's natural alone. Um, and all of this is inside the fence as it was. It's just a drawing of the fence. Um, working with the, uh, the landscaper, uh, he's provided the various different, um, you know, bushes, plants, et cetera, um, to go into the plan here. And we've also put in um, permeable paper um, in the section down by the walkway there. So we'll have regular pavers directly around the pool and that four, you know, four foot, five foot space. And then we'll have permeable pavers in the, in the lower section down by the walkway to allow for infiltration and, and runoff and whatnot. Um, you see there as well, there's gonna be about an eight inch wall um, whereby to protect the pavers from the plantings on that side, and there'll be about a one foot wall as this will be slightly uh, depressed from the rest of the, the lawn uh, on the right hand side of the wall there. Uh, it'll be one step down from the patio to the pool, pool patio as it is. Um, you can see the one step on the far side of the walkway is there as well. So it's a slight lift up on the, on the lower left and it's a slight down on the lower right as part of the greater plan. You can see the various different plantings that we've put in place here to try and offset the uh, build overall. So I'll stop there and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, I, Tom, I was wondering if it um, it was noted on one of the plans I saw, is this still 800 square feet plus or minus of uh, pavers that you're doing in these areas? I, I mean, I don't, I actually, I don't know the actual amount. 
Um, One of the plans said that, and I asked Vincent yeah. uh, that question, and he, he said the plan we had looked at was plus or minus uh, 800 square feet. That's, that sounds approximately right if you were to add everything up and all the little pieces that are happening there. Um, it sounds approximately right between the permeable and the non-permeable. I'm going to see if I have the other old plan as well that you're referring to. So this time uh, I received a set of plans that seemed like there was more vegetation on it. Um, yeah, one of the reasons I had him to redo that, do that, Chuck, from a vegetation perspective is because he was throwing the vegetation kind of all over the place and it didn't show where the fencing was. It didn't show, you know, because I wanted to make sure that when you came to look at it, that you're like, well, wait a second. I was looking, I was thinking it all over here. He's, he had one that if I had a mouse control, you know, where that 45 is, where the 22 is, he just kind of had it spread all over the place. And I wanted to make sure we got more precise measurements from where the patio is to where the fence is. So you knew what was inside the fence and, and there was, you know, the other stuff that we talked about outside the fence, the same. Um, so those are the various different uh, things that's going to go in there. Sure. And are you taking down any trees for this project? Um, as previously discussed, there are two trees on the inside of the fence coming down and one bush tree combination that's, um, you know, a, a problem on the outside of the fence coming down. Outside of that, we're not doing it. We're not doing anything else. There's a lot more trees on the outside of the fence. And I see that, did I, unless I'm missing it, you, you're not planting, replanting a tree. No, no trees. There's blueberry bushes going in. The six blueberry low bushes going in is uh, the compensation that's planned right now. There's there's high bushes as well. The vibranium high bushes. I'm not sure how those qualify in your in your counts necessarily, but there's six of each essentially. The low bush and the high bush going in. I, I'm not, uh, so I, I remember the pictures that you had before, I, they're not on the screen, we don't have them available tonight, but um, what's beyond this fence in this area, is it densely packed with trees or? There's, um, it's, a, it's a downward yard. slope. Uh, if you remember, there are quite a few trees on the, the back side. If you go, you know, take that 45 and work your way to the back, there's mm -hmm. quite a few trees on that, you know, on that side. Um, and then there's um, a lot of those like, um, yeah, they got a bunch of yellow flowers on them, like bush type um, things that are uh, right outside the fence there as well. Um, I don't know I guess what they for, are. For taking down all those trees, I think it would be it would be nice to, uh, and I know that we allow um, shrubs to replace trees, but it would be nice to see a tree going back in, but um, I'll leave that up to the commission. So I'm finished my comments. Anybody else? Yeah, um, it's my understanding that the area, as we're looking at this map, the area to the left on downslope is your neighbor's yard and their trees. But we're, so their lawn, I mean, I remember the picture you um, took of, of looking between your backyard and down towards the stream. And it basically looked like a yard a lawn going all the way down between. So um, I'm happy to see um, shrubs, this, this whole like shrub planting plan. Um, it doesn't look like based on this, and I'm sorry, I don't have your previous plan in front of me. Um, it looks like the pool doesn't it doesn't extend all the way to the um, 
page up extent of your yard of your property not and even I, close not even close and i know you have a lawn and then past that is a i think you have a fence and then more trees if that's yeah. where your property goes back so um I, and I could just, if I could, in, in that regard, my property is like a big triangle. Right, um, right. You can envision a big triangle and beyond the fence on the backside of my property is tree upon tree upon tree from the forest perspective down to the, the quote unquote riverfront, the little brook that's down there. Um, so there's no lack of trees on my property in any way, right. shape or form. Right, and this is kind of tucked I suppose, um, between a patio and a house wall. Um, and you have a good number of shrubs. Um, of course, we love trees. You get that message loud and clear. We love trees. So if you want to, one of these days, plant more trees in your yard, um, we would welcome that. Um, and I don't know about the rest of the commission, but um, I think there's a, a significant number of plantings here. And um, at this point, I don't necessarily see a need to, to put a tree in this spot right now, but I'd like to hear from others. Uh, Martha has her hand up. Go ahead, Martha. Um, I'm just looking at the, the list and it looks to me like the top thing on the list is mountain laurel and doesn't that count as a shrub as well? It does. Yeah. So he's got six high bush viburnums and six and five mountain laurels plus the low bush blueberries. So um, I kind of go along with what um, Anika said is Right. In terms of taking down three trees, he's putting up at least 11 good sized shrubs. Other trees are nice, but um, I, I think I don't have a problem with his plan. And I like that the um, any runoff is going to get slowed down by the, uh, the plantings he's putting in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. David Knett has his hand up. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Um, I recall when the addition was put on the house, I believe that there was either two or three trees planted at that time along the back edge of the lawn um, at that time. So Tom has already planted trees on this lot as part of a uh, prior um, prior application with the Conservation Commission. I'd like to take credit for that, David, but I don't think that's true. We, do, we have planted a lot of bushes, though, in the front of the house that didn't exist before. Um, I appreciate the effort. I really do. Uh, but then, like I said, <laughs> look at the back of my yard. You know, there's, there's an infinite number of trees. That poor guy that was here earlier that said he's taking down 20 trees. I could take down 20 trees. And still down so, um, I, thought, I thought that there were some trees planted where uh, on the edge of the, the back of the yard behind your garage that was planted there. Maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking. No, those were there before. Um, those trees, actually, those two trees are, are the ones that are uh, inside the fence or that are two that are coming down as part of this process. Oh, okay. um, it planted rose bushes back there that we're re, we're rehoming right now, so we can keep them. Those don't count in this greater set, but they'll go back in right outside the fence as well. Um, but we did put about 22 bushes in the front of the house. We didn't have anywhere near that many beforehand, so we've been doing a lot to add different things around where it where it fit. Well, I think with the mountain laurel and the the viburnum and the the blueberry bushes, I think that counts for the trees that are taken out. That's what I would vote anyway. Yeah. I, I think we're I'm, hearing the I'm, same thing from everybody. So, I, I mean, I think. 
I'm, I'm satisfied. Yeah. Uh, he's taken out. I just think that the um, habitat value of a tree, you know, increases over time and the shrubs and we're, we're net lot losing trees on the usable part of the, of the property. But again, uh, the, the commission, uh, I'm satisfied with the planting. It was a lot better than, than we first got um, when this project came in. All right. So. Chuck, do we need to make a decision on this? What, just, uh, what yeah, is... just approve uh, this plan and uh, we're all set. Yeah. Just make a motion to approve the plan. I move we approve the plan um, we've been discussing for 181 South Street. <clears throat> Second that motion. Uh, Mike Flynn, in favor. Anika Scanlon, in favor. Arthur Moore, in favor. John Sullivan, in favor. David Panette, in favor. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for hanging in there. Up, it looks like you guys still have the rest of the night, so have a good night. And... Sorry, we always had you at the end of here. Good luck okay. tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. It is 1130. Um, I want to, you know, I think there's some important old new business that we can still get in here, but, um, and, and get an update on, but we may not get to all of these. Um, I think the, the big one, uh, one of the ones we can get to next is Matera property tree evaluation and parking area. Um, so Chuck, this is this is in regards to the the trees, you know, on the conservation land in, in Materia near fourteen seventeen Main Street, correct? Uh, yeah, uh, fourteen forty seven Main Street and Cabin. Where okay. where? Uh, so uh, right are you doing the update or, or? Yeah, so I could, so no. my understanding, and, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but so back in October of last year, I remember this coming, You, I think this was in the old new business category, you came before us, uh, you brought this before us. This was uh, a resident that had reached out in regards to uh, trees that they had some concerns that were not on his property, but on conservation land. Um, I think at the it's time bare, you went out and you. Yeah, it's the Bear Meadow property. Bear Meadow. Okay. Um, I think at the time you went out and you met with uh, the tree warden to go over the tree locations. Um, I forget. I know you sent an email to me not that long ago, but uh, essentially the, there were two different areas that were identified. Um, here, Chuck, do you mind? explaining explaining what ultimately was decided back then i've got to charge i got to plug my computer in before it dies. <laughs> sure um so we were contacted by the resident that seems that lives right on the edge of the bare amount of property and there were some trees i think one tree had fallen down and uh i went out there with mike hannaford and we had decided to take some trees down and, and that side so if you go up one 1447's driveway, it's almost straight in front of you. So you're looking straight into Bear Meadow. There was another section behind his house. Um, so now you're looking directly down the hill, <coughs> not directly at, at the material cabin, but in that direction and towards the observation uh, deck. And there's some towering pines there. And there was a, a whole grove of pines and these are very close to uh, the property line. They're very tall and they're close to um, 1447's home. And um, at that initial site visit, uh, it was decided that there were no issues and there was no reason to take down those pine trees. About two weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, I've kind of lost track at this point, 
Uh, the gentleman came home from uh, either a vacation or, or a trip and one of those towering pine trees had fallen uh, or just uprooted in a gust of wind and blown away from the house and got caught up in another tree and was hanging there. Um, Mike Hannaford went out there with his crew and removed that tree and the tree that was hung in. And Mike says he removed a tree to get to those two trees also. They were all cut and dropped right there. So those initial emergency trees were taken care of. Um, hazardous, maybe it was a better word than, a, than emergency. Um, now we went out there, then that was the Friday and on the Sunday went back, I went back with um, Will Finch and we uh, had a conversation with Mr. Um, Poirier who is the gentleman that lives at 1447. And he said that he was concerned about additional trees. And the, the, this whole thing is to, this whole background is because I would like the commission to go out there and, and see the property and see the trees and make a determination. This is not a wetland issue. This is to, in a sense, homeowners or landowners and <coughs> One landowner is saying, look, these trees are disturbing and he, uh, he would like us to really kind of understand his position when the wind blows and his house being, I mean, I, I would think the trees are like 60 so feet tall and his house might be 25 feet away, if that. Um, so... Uh, the 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 path up through Matera out to the out to the viewing platform is where uh, you would go, and then you would walk along towards um, Pearl Street, and you would see this this location. I, I could go back out there and just put a put a tag around all the trees, but uh, what I would like is for the commission, all the commission, to go out and assess this. And then we have to make a decision about whether they're coming down or not. Mike? Yeah, so Chuck, I, I think you said it just right. Sorry, I had to plug the computer in. But, but so I think what we need to do here is just make sure we schedule a site visit um, to get out there. I think in particular, you know, I know Carl's not here, but um, I'd like to see if we can get Carl to go. And, and Chuck, maybe you, you know, I, you know, I encourage everybody to try to make it at the same time if we can, but, you know, I, I I think Carl has uh, an understanding of the trees more than certainly a, a technical background more than we do. Um, and so I think it'd be a good idea to, you know, try to schedule around him if we can get him. Chuck, maybe you and I can reach out to Carl tomorrow, see what works for him. And what I would say is I would encourage between now and next meeting is for all the commissioners to get out there if we can. Go ahead. So um, let me up update that. Uh, we want to yeah get back to everybody by Monday. Okay. So we're, we're coming up on a weekend and it's a good opportunity. I can reach out to Carl. Martha is also, um, you know, like say Martha goes out, I could go out with someone and Carl could go out with someone and Martha could go out with someone. And I think we have a tree person with everybody if we did that. And I'm, yep. I'm sorry if I missed any other tree people, but um, uh, you know, and then we could, be within the CV-19 uh, protocol and also view the trees. So, um, you know, I'm available uh, tomorrow, Friday and Saturday. Um, so I'll, I'll reach out to everyone and I'll just write down when other people who are still on are available and I'll put something together and, um, and uh, get it out to the commission. Sorry, Chuck, you did tell me that. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that that makes sense. And so that way by Monday, so part of the benefit here is we can get to uh, DPW and forestry. And if there are items that we see necessary that, that need to come down or, or need to make some sort of recommendation to them of what we've seen, we can make it by the beginning of the week. Okay. Chuck, I can uh, make it tomorrow. Okay. What time are you thinking tomorrow?
Um, I'm available early and late, early in the day and, and late in the day. So anytime after three or before before nine. Same here. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. I might, I probably have to just take my own trip on Friday. Tomorrow's a mess for me. Um, and but, we okay. should actually go in small groups and not have a, cor a quorum of us at the same time. Is that correct? Uh, it's like it's not a uh, permit uh, before us. Uh, I am, I'm going to check on that, but for now we're, we're caution about the open meeting law. Yes, I want small groups and no discussion, which is going to be a problem if we have to give a decision by Monday. But, um, but so you could have three, you could have three people go. I'm free Friday or I could do Saturday morning. All right. I can do Friday afternoon. So three yeah. for Friday, do you guys want to see if Friday afternoon works for Mike and Martha and John? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I think that makes sense. What time works for you guys? We've got a nine to 12 meetings, one time afternoon, I think. I'll say two o'clock. Two o'clock? Two? Okay. Meet okay. at the McBear cabin. I think that would be a good a good spot. Yeah, parking area. Yeah, it's uh, um, and Nico, you and me can uh, figure out a time for tomorrow. Okay. Did, did you say tomorrow works? Yeah. And I, and that works for me because um, the only the only thing is um, well we'll send we'll send Carl out by himself, I guess. Well, we missed. I know Dave's still here. I'm not sure Dave's going to be available. Um, I'll get in touch with, with Carl. I'll go out with Carl. Okay, we'll see if we can get you and Carl together. You hey, guys, hey, that no one has no one has the ex experience. I worked as a logger in 1954. Did so, I forget about you, Dave? Yeah. I'm sorry. That had nothing to do with the comment you made at the last meeting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. My question is, um, if the trees are 60 feet tall and 25 feet from the house, then yeah, if they fell toward his house, they'd hit his house. Um, but is this the house that was built like really recently tucked in back there? And weren't the trees there already when they put the house up? Um, so I guess that's sort of what my question is, is what is our responsibility toward their protecting their house from the trees that were already there when they bought the house? So uh, our, our responsibility, and I don't know if this is a, an official response for um, the Conservation Commission, but I know that I've heard this from Mike and I've heard it from the town that I'm a you know, commission member in. Um, once it's identified, we need to check it out. And if it's a hazard, it has to come down. Um, you know, if it's not a hazard. Chuck, you, yeah. you went out there with Mike Hannaford. Mike Hannaford is the town of Redding's tree guy. And you both said, there's no problem here. And the tree fell down anyway. So, you know, what is it that the Conservation Commission is going to go out and do that the tree professional for the town of Redding who made a, a, a decision that said, there's no problem here, but the tree fell down anyway. What are we gonna make as a decision or what are we gonna be looking at? I mean, I don't wanna sound like, you know, the guy that's a stick in the mud, but you know, I mean, let's be practical about this. What are we really gonna go out there and look at and decide? You know, we're not the professionals. We have the guy that's the professional for the town go out there and he said there was no problem and the tree fell down anyway. So what are you looking for? Uh, just what I said. So, Dave, I, I think the point would be, you know, at this point, you know, so Mike was out there. He took he took some additional trees down, and and, and Dave ultimately ultimately the the decision may be, hey, Mike, you know, we we see a couple more trees. Like 
can you can you reevaluate if we need to re-engage the the tree warden and yep. say you know that there's there's locations on conservation land we've been notified about the trees can you reevaluate these locations you know i i i think you know he was just out there he was just taking down trees um you know uh, i'm i'm hoping that if there was something else he saw was a hazard that was going to be done at around that same time but but we haven't explicitly asked him so uh, I think we need to see, we need to ask the question. I think, and, I, and Mike, Mike looked at the trees and he's told me before that you can make a call on a tree and it can come down on the way back to the DPW department. That's absolutely. So Mike, Mike didn't do anything, uh, you know, I don't think that's a, a, a <laughs> knock on Mike that it, that it came down later. Um, so it's that material, bare metal land is in the care and custody of the Conservation Commission, and we have to be part of the decision. Yeah. Is one of our options to have them make the trees shorter rather than taking them out altogether? Which would look really stupid, but it would make them not dangerous if they fell down. Yeah, there's, um, there's, so we could, we could evaluate the situation, tell them we're, we're um, you know, there's, don't take any trees down, take the trees down. We need a, we need Mike to understand that. Um, we need to understand if he saw any other trees that were an issue. I think ultimately some of those trees are very close and, um, if the town um, can get some, some machinery in there, then the close trees probably should come down. And we could ask Mike to use some of the money that we give him for the tree fund to maybe plant some new trees in that area. But that's why I wanted everyone to see it because it's, it's not, I mean, will topping them work? Um, you know, depending on how much you take off. So, and then there's the thing about, are we gonna leave all those trees out there? But the first step is to go out and, and check this out and then just see for yourself. So you, you're com comfortable with what is happening. So I sort of see this assignment as a little bit of active land management of our conservation land. Mm -hmm. And it, it happens to be right up against a situation where a resident has had one of the trees from conservation land fall real close and made him alarmed, I'm sure. Yeah. Understandably so. So as stewards of this property, it's our duty to go out and take care of it, make the decisions about <laughs> what happens on the land. Right. This is a we don't get this job. I think this is the first time. Second, third, like this doesn't happen that often. No, it doesn't. It doesn't really happen that often. But it, it's you're right. It's like your neighbor, wherever you live now, is asking you about a tree that he feels like is an issue. You know, where the where the land stewards of that area. Um, and I do want it to go quickly because I think it's it's taken a long time. So. Um, hopefully we can keep up the schedule and um, we can get back to the DPW department and, and everyone on, on uh, Monday or beginning of the week at least. So Chuck, how Chuck, are you expecting to get- With that being said, um, how, do we, how do we make it? So, I mean, ultimately we, with the COVID-19, um, you know, there's been, we have a little bit more freedom to make a decision outside of public meeting whatever the case is like you know do you do you want to fill me in on on what you saw there on thursday and how do we make a decision uh, appropriately as a commission i think this is uh something that you're you're probably going to go out there and see some pretty tall trees that are healthy yeah. Um, I mean, we could put our investigative hats on and, 
you know, it's, you know, trees that tall. I mean, I, I'm thinking the less about the, the techni technicality of it. So what's the best way to, so do you guys want to let me know, you know, if, you know, what you see out there and what, what you, you know, what, what your opinion is and, and I can, you know, Chuck, you and I can work on delivering some sort of message to, to whether it's to DPW or, in a, and then ultimately the, the resident, um, you know, this is, this is what we've seen, you know, or, or this is how we should move forward. I, I, I do think uh, at least some follow up with DPW and forestry should be, you know, you know, Mike, you know, this is what we've seen, you know, can, do you have any, any other issues? I, I would like some sort of final concurrence with him since we, he is the expert we have. We have been informed that he can, he can and will go out there for us if we've got questions. Um, but I'd like that after the, like everybody here has been, had a chance to see it. Um, I just, is that the process? You know, let me know what you think and you and I can, can take it from there. That's, that's the process. Uh, I don't, yeah. uh, my initial thought on this is that uh, everyone can contact, we can go out and make, we can go out and make uh, an, an assessment and then um, everyone can send their assessment to me and I'll be able to react to it. Okay. So. Is this at the follow uh, open meeting up? I was, yeah, I started out by saying, I'm gonna check on that, but since this isn't a permit right. or a wetland issue, and we're actually acting as land stewards, I think we have a little bit of latitude here. I would think so. We could always give a recap at the next meeting for anybody following this from the public's perspective. Yeah, I, I did wonder if the tree warden, if he took them down, if a tree hearing would not be needed. Um, you know, so that's that ball is in his court, but that was my only thought on this. And are okay. any of these trees close to a wetland? I know there are some vernal pools and things a little bit further in. No, this is um, almost at it's the top. Outer, outer Whatever, way, way upland. If at all. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, that takes care of that. And um, so, the, and then the parking area. So, the parking area at Lobs Pond and the parking area at Matera Cabin, we wanted to um, just highlight the fact that there's a lot of potholes and these places get plowed by the DPW department in the winter time. And we made a request with Ryan was speaking about it a little bit. He said that we're going to. It's going to work with us, um, but my thought is that if they're plowing in the winter, if we could get some spring cleanup there to get the gravel back in the parking lot area, lob spawn, and the, and the potholes filled, it would be it would be great. So um, I was hoping that a letter could be written and sent uh, to either our liaison uh, and or uh, one of the select board or the someone at town hall. Um, and I think if you were gonna send it to town hall, it would be a request to the DPW department and it would be Jane Kinsella. So um, that was that item. And hopefully that will, if someone wants to write that letter, that would be great. If you wanna go and review the places first. Um, I just wanna let you know that uh, as far as speaking directly to our liaison. Um, I don't believe that I can do that. I thought I was given clear direction a couple of years back and um, it wasn't that we were supposed to have any interaction, me, but the commission can, right? And our liaison is Karen Herrick. Um, for, oh, we do have a liaison. Yeah, so if anyone okay. wants to reach out to Karen and, and bring these issues up. Uh, we talked about the hydrant on Mill Street, and it looks like that they amended or they put the soil back in. It was filled with clay. It would be very hard to establish any kind of uh, uh, vegetation on top of that. And I asked Ryan to either remove it or put some different or more organic material on that. Uh, it, 
he didn't really tell me a time frame or even talk about it a second time. But I think with the road paving project and the end of that hydrant project, we'll, we'll be able to, to work on that. Um, the cross street, I mentioned that at one of our meetings that the DPW department, we had gone out there for an engineering site visit and all that material that's in back of Smith Oil, which is our site for this project that we just had on the agenda that was uh, 259 and 267 Main Street is coming down and depositing itself in the back and the lowlands just as it's, it widens out beyond the stream. And the DPW wants to go in there and clean out probably 20 feet of that. So Alex Rizicki is going to put together a uh, package for us to review on how they would do that. It includes tree, pre, uh, tree protection, matting to go across the homeowner's lawn, a limit of work line, and um, they're going to remove the material, put it in another dump truck, and take it off site. So that's coming up, but um, that work is going most likely going to be deemed an emergency because it's causing flooding to the neighbors. So I sent that email out to everybody. You can go and look for yourselves and see if you think it's an emergency or not. But there's there's a quite a significant amount of um, flooding that happens in everyone's backyard um, in that area. And then the last thing is mosquito control is coming to town. I sent out that email also, and they'll be they'll be um, working at uh, Austin Prep and Willow Street, and they're going to create or recreate the channel that exists there. And they'll be driving some pretty big equipment into the uh, into the wetland area to create that channel, and that'll happen in June. Uh, I wouldn't worry about an emergency permits, the dumping sign, enforcement order, but if we could get an approval for the minutes, that would be great. Do I hear a motion? Make a motion. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes? Does anybody have comments on the minutes? Does Hearing anybody none. have a chance to review them? And does anybody have any comments? Uh, now do I hear a motion? <laughs> make a motion to approve the minutes of 4 8 2020. I second. Mike Flynn. Um, uh, yes. Mike <laughs> Scanlon, yes. Mark Moore, yes. John Sullivan, yes. David Panette, yes. Great. Um, I'm willing uh, to write the letter um, to Karen Herrick asking the DPW to, to regrade the two parking lots you mentioned. Great. Uh, when you when you write that, could you uh, share it with the commission and um, and um, before you send it, and maybe we could give some input too after you do that first. Okay. Does that sound agreeable to everyone? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Great. Are there? Uh, there's there's two. Two other stragglers left. Are there any other comments from the public? I've unmuted everyone, so if you can, you can. Uh, they can speak if they want, uh, or raise their hand. They look muted to me. They are, but that they have to unmute themselves at this point. So they've been unmuted. At um, I'll do it now. I don't know. Yeah, so no, they're still um, they're still muted. So I did it um, two different ways. So I don't think there's anything else to. Sure. Can you hear me? I can hear I, you. Yeah. I think you hung up on me. <laughs> Some, Sorry. Something happened where I got kicked out. <laughs> I know you have to be got to be quick on your toes. Um, someone was asking me a question. I actually just left the room and I come back and just sat down. I was like. What? But yeah, you got to be quick. Things are, these Zoom meetings are different. All right, can we get a motion to, clo uh, to close? I'm done. I hear a motion to close. Second. I'm moved. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, please feel free oh, to.
keep in touch through emails. Of favor. Raise your hand, please. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Please keep in touch through emails. And if you see anything around town, contact me. It's getting it's long in between meetings, and I'd like to, you know, keep in touch with people. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. For staying Bye, everyone. Thanks again. Yeah.